I'm Alice Loxton, and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things royal history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. You've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount for History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details in the video description and use the code REALROYALTY, all one word, when you sign up. Now, on with the show. Clothes are the ultimate form of visual communication. By looking at the way people dressed, we can learn not only about them as individuals, but about the society they lived in. I'm Amber Butchart, fashion historian. And in the words of Louis XIV, I believe that fashion is the mirror of history. So, taking historical works of art as our inspiration, Traditional tailor Ninia Michaela and her team will be recreating historical clothing using only authentic methods. Oh, look at that, it's changing colour in the air. And I'll be finding out what they tell us about the people who wore them. I'm assuming the king wouldn't be dressing himself though, right? And the times they lived in. Ooh. And seeing what they're like to wear. Ooh. These days, it's royal women who provide the fashion talking points. But there's one male royal, Charles II, who despite being dead for over 300 years, is credited with instigating a new form of menswear that's still with us today. This portrait shows Charles II being presented with a pineapple by his gardener, John Rose. Most likely dating from 1677, the year Charles shaved off his moustache, it's thought that the portrait could have been painted as a tribute to Rose, who died that year. Charles is the Restoration King. This is absolutely crucial in terms of the way that he's dressing, the way that he chooses to present himself. His position is quite precarious, and he uses dress and fashion throughout his reign as a means of consolidating his power and sending particular political messages. I find this portrait really fascinating. He's dressed in a very similar way to the gardener. The king here is essentially saying, I am like you, but at the same time, you must kneel before me. So the way Charles is dressed here is really emblematic of a shift in the male silhouette. Now, what's especially interesting is that this really came about as the product of political rivalry between two cousins who were also kings. So I'm really keen to investigate more about his dress and especially about the way that Charles used his clothing to consolidate his political place. Given that this is such a rare portrait of Charles in plain, informal clothes, I'm really interested to find out from our historical tailor, Ninya, if there's more to this suit than meets the eye. So Charles II, Restoration King, the Merry Monarch himself. <laughs> His suit here looks quite simple. Is it actually a sort of simple outfit? He is trying to do the man of the people simple suit look, but no, it won't surprise you <laughs> to hear me say it isn't as simple as it looks. For a start, you can see all these black um, clusters around the waist of his breeches and around the bottom of his breeches there. Mm -hmm. Also at his cuffs here and the shoulder. They're loops of silk ribbon. They were called knots, and that would be yards and yards of silk ribbon. And they're completely without function. They're, they're just added for the effect. And you can see all these buttons and buttonholes. I've counted them. There are more than 100 <laughs> buttons that we have to source or make. That is fiddly work. It is fiddly, and it's time-consuming, even when you work quite quickly. And I'd say I could do a nice buttonhole in maybe five minutes. That's more than a day's work just doing buttonholes. Wow. Charles had a thing for encouraging the use of English cloth, but it was really the finest cloth, still very, very costly. And I think it's quite clear to see that the lining here, what the artist is trying to show is that it's a silky fabric. Mm. I think it's what we call shop fabric today. So the, the threads going one way are one colour and the threads going the other way are a different colour. And at the time they called it changeable because yeah. the colour changes, um, like this sample here. 
Oh. You can see the yellow threads coming out there and the red there. It is, in fact, colour. changeable. It is, in fact, changeable. Yeah. Yeah. Even though this looks quite simple, it is still a display of wealth. It absolutely wealth. is. There's an awful lot of money being spent on that suit, even though it's not immediately obvious where it goes. While our suit might be more ornate than first glance would suggest, the suit Charles's brother, James II, wore for his wedding to Mary of Modena is definitely fit for a king. No longer on display to the public, it's held in storage at the V&A. But curator Susan North has allowed me to come along and have a look. It's absolutely incredible. I mean, the gold and silver embroidery here, I can just imagine it kind of glinting in the candlelight. It would have been an absolute spectacle. Yes, and you can see in areas like the inside of the cuff and under the arm where it's a bit more protected, that gives a sense of just how spectacular the suit would have looked when it was worn. I'm absolutely in love with this colour of the lining. It's very similar to the colour of the lining in the portrait that we're looking at. You can see almost a familial relationship, I think, between this and the clothes that Charles is wearing in the portrait. I love the amount of buttons that we've got going up here. It's very similar to what we're recreating and with these buttonholes as well. It's remarkable that they all survive. Um, very often on older garments, you know, they, they recycle the buttons into something else and they cut them off. It seems to me to embody some of the contradictions that we see in some of Charles's wardrobe at around this time as well. You've got the wool, but you've also got the extravagance of the embroidery. You've got this sort of much simpler, more workaday silhouette in a way. But then again, you've also got this really showy extravagance as well. The coat itself, of course, was never a fashionable garment. It was strictly utilitarian. What Charles does with the suit is he decrees that this is court dress. Now, you'd never show up in court wearing your ordinary riding coat. I mean, you just wouldn't do that. So if you're going to take what is a utilitarian garment and make it court dress, well, you have to bling it up a bit. <laughs> Charles's finances were tightly controlled by Parliament. So while his clothes may have been made from the most luxurious fabrics, there was no room for waste. So these breeches don't fit on the width of this cloth. I'm going to do what's called piecing, which is where the excess of the pattern is folded back. And it means we're going to have an additional seam but that's very period. Even the king is waste not, want not. It was seven years apprenticeship, and then you'd have to work as a, a journeyman, and then you would essentially have to do an exam. And a lot of tailors specialised in particular garments, so they only made coats or they only made breeches. So I do often think when we're doing these sorts of reconstructions that a period tailor would just find it absolutely laughable that we attempt to do so many different things. I probably wouldn't qualify in uh, period tailor's eyes. <laughs> and I'm a woman. I mean, how ridiculous is that? <laughs> no, tailors were almost definitely men. I'm leaving quite small gaps between the patterns because the seam allowance can actually be very small. The smaller amount of seam allowance you have, the less wasteful this process is going to be. And the happier the king will be. So these just get backstitched on with linen thread and the matching silk thread is saved for the things that matter like buttonholes and sewing on trims, things that really show. It breaks quite easily as, you're, as you sew it through the fabric, the friction of that action wears away at it quite quickly. So what you have to do is run it through a block of wax and that smooths down all the hairy fibres and enables the thread to slide through the fabric easier. So you can see it will have this strange extra seam on the side, which is odd to the modern eye often, but uh, when it's nicely pressed flat, 
it will disappear into the coat and be barely noticeable. And I think these, all these funny extra seams make it more interesting a garment, personally, because they are there on the original ones. Charles II had lived through civil war, exile and the abolition of the monarchy. More than any other English king, he understood the powerful political message a monarch's clothes conveyed, so most of the time chose to be painted in classical dress or armour. I'm keen to find out from historian Rebecca Redeal how Charles navigated the tightrope between re-establishing the monarchy and separating himself from the excesses that had contributed to its fall. So here we can see Charles II in a way that is much more typical of how he liked to be represented. How important was it that he sort of transmitted this very regal style? Well, he had a really difficult balancing act because on the one hand, he had been invited back as a monarch, so he wanted to project this image of monarchy and kingship. But then on the other hand, he was very aware that his father, Charles I, had been executed for being too extravagant in his style and tastes, and also being a little bit remote from the people and aloof in some respects. So how did Charles II try to distance himself and his image from his father? By not actually being that extravagant on a day-to-day -day basis, the clothes that he wore were pretty sensible, the colours weren't loud. It was only when it came to the ceremonial occasions that he really upped the ante, as did the rest of the court. And this is where we get these fantastic accounts from Samuel Pepys about people being clad in silver, gold, him not being able to look at the court <laughs> because it was hurting his eyes too much. The other thing to bear in mind as well was Charles II grew up, spent his teenage years in disguise, going from various city to city across the continent. He mixed with all and sundry. He was more of um, a relatable man than his father anyway. So it's a real tightrope that he's walking, isn't it? Yes, it is, very much so. Charles had spent time at the French court while this man Louis XIV was establishing it as the centre of fashion, an idea that still persists today. Charles envied Louis's wealth, his style and his absolute power, and Louis fully understood the relationship between political power and the spectacle of fashion. There's no doubt that Charles was influenced by his cousin's sartorial splendour. Despite his careful manipulation of his public image, Charles II's court, with its French tastes, was still considered profligate. The public's antipathy was intensified by three disastrous events. War, plague, and in 1666, the Great Fire, an event which many blamed on the French. So on the 7th of October, 1666, Charles issued a declaration that his court would reject French fashions and create an English style. And this was the long vest worn with the knee-length coat. This gave the male silhouette a much leaner appearance, a complete change from the more triangular doublet and hose. Now, because of this and his championing of the vest, Charles II is credited with creating the three-piece suit. What's unusual in fashion history is that we can place this innovation to its exact date. And it's all thanks to Samuel Pepys. 8th of October, 1666. The King hath yesterday in council declared his resolution for setting a fashion for clothes. It will be a vest. I know not well how, but it is to teach the nobility thrift. Sadly for Charles, according to Pepys, Louis thought so little of his cousin's vests that he dressed his servants in them. 22nd of November, 1666. Monsieur Batelier tells me the King of France hath, in defiance to the King of England, caused all his footmen to be put into vests, which, if true, is the greatest indignity ever done by one prince to another. So have there been any particular challenges so far? No, it's fairly straightforward. We're really doing the preparation now to actually begin the epic buttonholing. And so how many people would have worked on the original outfit? We've got the I King's think, Tailor. Yes, 
he would have had um, probably a journeyman tailor working with him as well. So the King's tailor is a master tailor. Mm -hmm. He's the one that would have cut out all of the pattern pieces and decided where the pieced seams were going and all of that. He would have then handed it to his journeyman tailor. So let's say that's Harriet's the journeyman tailor for today. Yeah. She's yeah. doing the actual putting the pieces together once they've been cut. And then we'd have an apprentice. That can be Hannah over there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so Hannah's got to a stage in her apprenticeship where she's allowed to put some of the pieces together, but we've given her the linings rather than the expensive top fabric. Right. So would you like to try a working buttonhole? I would. I would like to try very much. Great. Yes. What you need to do is use this buttonhole cutter. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah. OK. So you hold that on, on there, kind of upright like this. I'll just show you that. So following the line like that, and then you're just going to tap it smartly with the hammer. Wow, <laughs> this is a lot more cut. tool heavy than I was expecting. Okay. <laughs> oh! That's it. There we go. Perfect, oh, lovely. So then, we take your needle and thread. So we're going to put the needle through the slit. So take it all the way through so they're not going to go through to the back. Yeah. And then we're going to go back in and we're going to come up just beside where that thread was coming out. Right, yeah. That's it. And before you take the needle all the way through, you're going to loop your thread around the end of your needle. And this is what makes the buttonhole stitch. And pull it back towards yourself so you don't get too much of a tangle. And what should happen? Oh, pull it back oh, towards yeah. the edge of the hole. That's it. And that's made your first little buttonhole knot. Great. And you keep going until you get all the way to the end of the slip. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I feel like it's going to take me a lot longer than well, five minutes. It will, yes. This is um, this is why Taylor's had apprenticeships of seven years because there's so many things like that that you've really got to perfect the art of before you'd be allowed to get anywhere near the king's coat. What's incredible is that we're looking at these tiny details of which there are hundreds mm -hmm. on this garment. And I mean the amount of work and time that goes into just these tiny details is mm. immense, mm. isn't it? All that's involved is mere hours of labour. <laughs> mere hours of labour. And so you're telling me that this, that I'm, that, you know, I'm killing myself over here is actually unskilled labour. Um, essentially it is, really. It's not worth an awful lot. <laughs> that's a shame. <laughs> so I think I'm really coming up to the end of this uh, buttonhole. I've just been finishing the Oh, the little bar across the end. Last edge, okay. yeah. If you lay it down on the surface, and then we can snip it off. So, let's have a look. OK. Uh, I think I might have oh. accidentally... <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure your button's going to go through there. Shall I see? Yeah. Shall I have a go? OK, let's see. Oh, Ooh. Ooh, is it going to go? <laughs> <laughs> Just about. It's fine. Just it's fine. about. It's not complicated, but it is very fiddly. It's very, you have to be very dexterous, don't you? It's, it's... You do. There's, and there's still an awful lot of hours work even in an apparently very simple suit. Yeah, hours and hours. I mean, who'd have thought that a suit fit for a king <laughs> would take so much work? <laughs> I guess it's kind of obvious when you think about it. <laughs> yeah. Charles II's wardrobe accounts are held at the National Archives and provide a fascinating insight into his carefully constructed image. Looking at the actual accounts of Charles II's wardrobe is a, quite a strange feeling, really. It's really exciting seeing all of this stuff, how, you know, the detail that it's been documented. This was clearly something quite important that money was being spent on. And actually seeing it here in this sort of glorious handwriting is really amazing, it feels quite special. So some of the first orders that we can see in the account book unsurprisingly are for his coronation robes of purple velvet lined with powdered ermine and laced with embroidered gold lace and is really about creating a spectacle of power. This is what a king looks like. These accounts show that Charles loved clothes, ordering on average between 30 and 40 new suits a year. However, while his cousin Louis XIV might have been able to parade around in diamond-covered coats, Charles knew he had neither the money nor the political clout for power dressing. 
We see a lot of plain cuts, a lot of muted colours as well, especially grey. And also this one I particularly like, which is references to sad colour. So the vest first makes its appearance in the accounts in 1666, and we see it numerous times here for making His Majesty a purple cloth coat, hose and vest. We see vest really starting to feature throughout. However, while Charles was really proclaiming this as an English style, what he didn't mention so much at court was that this was actually an order to his French tailor, Claude Sorceau. So Claude Sorceau is quite an important character here. He was Charles's tailor when Charles was in exile. Charles brought him back to England when the monarchy was reinstated and he remained his tailor for the next 10 years. So this really shows that although Charles was very keen on promoting English fashions, he couldn't fully escape the influence of French style. For me, the most telling and poignant entry of the wardrobe accounts is the very first. What's interesting about this is that despite these accounts starting in 1660, the year of Charles's restoration to the throne, they're stated as being in the 13th and 14th year of his reign. So what we're seeing here is the reign of Charles II being dated right back to the time that his father was executed. So all of those intervening years have just been written out of this history. Despite only being at the start of their sartorial journey, it's easy to recognise the vest and coat introduced by Charles II as the forerunners of today's waistcoat and jackets. The breeches, however, are another matter. These are his breeches. They have a waistband. It's going to have a button at the front. And at the back, there's a little gap. So on the waistband, there'll be some eyelets. So he can, he can sort of put weight on and let the back out a bit for a bit of ease, but he can't get smaller. At the moment, I'm putting in some uh, gathering cords so that we can draw them up into the waistband. And if I pull this one, this form of gathering is, is now called cartridge pleating. It forms the sort, of, the sort of folds that you can imagine on a cartridge belt. It's, it's just like where you, you, you put the cartridges in. But these aren't going to fit high on the waist. They're going to be quite low slung. If you look at the painting, there's a, a whole abundance of shirt hanging out over the top. He really does give the impression of someone who has, you know, he's got his coat open, he's got the, the shirt out, and the breeches are sort of hanging low. It's really very, a very like he's undressing. <laughs> yeah, a very sort of sensual look compared to the, the sort of slightly more buttoned up clothes of other, other eras. They might look a little bit short compared to trousers these days and obviously quite vulnerably loose. <laughs> but he, he would have had a pair of drawers underneath, linen drawers. So, and they were drawn in round the leg a bit more snugly. So there wouldn't have been anything uh, <laughs> inadvertent being displayed. I think that side of things was kept for um, private matters. Although obviously he had quite a lot of those. <laughs> 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 he was a bit free with his private matters. I've either miscounted or done one extra, so... Ah, well, then that's there a we spare. Go. So is it worth pinning on, say, 16, on just on one front? Yeah. Oh, they look really nice. Already? Mm, just they with... do. Ah, <laughs> look at that. <laughs> that is gorgeous. You can imagine him frolicking round. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they are merry britches, aren't they? Yeah. You see, that's the joy of it, isn't it? That even though there's, there are original garments that we can look at, when you make something and it's got its freshness about it, it's, mm. it's really exciting and it is slightly different. Put the bounce back in the king. <laughs> I initially chose this suit because I was fascinated by its simplicity. But as I've learned was often the case with Charles II, there's much more to it than meets the eye. 
Worn on the body, clothes change from lifeless fabric into a potent means of communication. I cannot wait to find out what I can learn from taking a walk in the King's new clothes. You've got this real sort of elegance in the arms and then these gorgeous cuffs here. And then these just sit <laughs> so low down. It seems really unnatural. So you've got, obviously, I knew you had all of this volume here, but it's just kind of the, the contrast between the two is quite an odd feeling. We don't sort of associate this with a men's silhouette, especially with a king's silhouette, but it just feels... And we expect men to be more built up around the shoulders than exactly. they were Exactly, yeah. And today, the whole point of tailoring, you know, Savile Row style tailoring, is to create that broad, yeah. sort of triangular torso that's, that we associate with very manly men and sort of epitome of the sort of and you'd classical never want masculine to ideal. Emphasise your hip area. No. <laughs> no. It's all about the narrow hips. Yeah. You seem quite comfortable there. Yeah, I think I, I think I would have been very comfortable there. I think I'd be comfortable wearing this today. I love it. You could quite happily kind of lounge, lounge about in it. And oh. I guess that's kind of the point. That's brilliant. <laughs> it's the posing. It's, you, you can stand still in that and look amazing as long as you just open up and have a bit of lining on show. And... But that's the effect that it has on you, like feeling these different proportions, feeling the fabrics, feeling the clothes on you, mm. actually makes you stand like we used mm. to seeing people stand mm -hmm. in that time. It's a very exciting feeling. Clothes want to be worn a certain way, don't they? Yeah. Exactly, and if the effect that they have on the stance and the way that we move, yeah. it's kind of, yeah, living history. I'm particularly enjoying seeing the flash of the, the little rows of buttons when, when you turn around, because they're just so sweet, aren't yes. they? Yes. And Hannah, what, those, all those ribbons just look great, don't they? I know, it's so bizarre to, to have seen them in a massive black pile yeah. and then to all of a sudden <laughs> see them flowing. You can imagine just all the movement in there, it's amazing. I think it's less silly because those britches on their own are it's a they're a very silly garment aren't yes they? <laughs> but with the outfit they make sense yes they on do the body. it's really nice makes me feel very elegant well, you look very elegant very graceful mm. Mm. seeing the outfit of charles ii made up kind of blew my mind when we went to see the portrait, it's in a very dark room and it can't be lit too harshly because everything's very old. It's also been above a fireplace for a long time. So it looks very dark and it's difficult to see the detail. So I was initially just bowled over by really how bright it is. It just looks exquisite. And also how you can really see the different details. You can really see the silk bows. You can really see the lining. It just looks incredibly elegant. We're moving towards a point today in men's fashion where gender binaries are really being broken down. So we actually see some contemporary designers designing outfits not a million miles away from this, or certainly taking on these ideas around decoration, around frippery, I guess. So it's almost like we've come full circle right back to Charles II in Restoration England. The picture that launched a thousand theories, Jan van Eyck's famous double portrait painted in 1434, is considered one of the most complex paintings in Western art. I chose this portrait for a number of reasons. It's something that has been written about extensively in art history. There's a real appetite for new information that can shed light on this portrait and the sitters. 
Now, historically speaking, it's also a very fascinating period. We've seen the emergence of mercantile capitalism all around port cities in Europe. So we begin to see the effects of trade really heavily on the way that people are dressing. Now also the emergence of the merchant. This is quite an interesting character. They challenge the previous very rigid structures of society. So there's an element of social mobility here. You can become very rich through trade. You don't necessarily have to have been born into wealth. And I'm really interested to see if this element of social mobility is reflected in the way that people are dressing. So there are a number of things going on with this portrait, plus I really love the colour green. This dress is so alien to our modern aesthetic. I'm really interested to find out from Ninja just how complicated it will be to make. I suppose the thing that strikes you first is just quite how much fabric there is in there. And then as you zoom in, you see these huge hanging sleeves which have the most incredible decoration going on at the bottom of them. What you're seeing there is literally layers of the fabric which have been cut with a special tool, a pinking tool, to give that very fragile, frayed look. And so the fabric itself, this gorgeous green fabric, what is this? What, what material is it? It was a kind of cloth that was woven very wide, so it was called broadcloth. This fabric today is usually called doe skin or superfine. But what these very small samples don't really show is how beautiful that looks in the picture. And that's because you need a larger piece of the fabric. So this is a piece of doe skin. So you can see that once it starts to drape and actually get oh, the yeah. light on it, it becomes a much more silky looking material. Yeah. People don't usually associate wool as being a luxury fabric, do they? They don't. And at this date, it really was one of England's finest exports and it was bought and used all over Europe. But it's not just the wool that we're seeing uh, here, is it? There's this fur trim as well. Now, where does this fur in particular come from? We're still thinking about what it might be. And one possibility is it might be um, an Arctic fox. Wow. Where does one get hold of Arctic fox? Well, for these people, it would have been imported. It would be Baltic. It's another expensive luxury item. And that's quite helpful in an age before central heating, isn't it? It would be really keep you warm. Yes. Wool and fur. Now, we're not going to be using any Arctic fox, I'm assuming, for no. this. So what will we be using? We'll be looking for a faux fur. So really throughout here, we're seeing quite a, an opulent display of wealth. Here. This literally wearing your wealth on your sleeves. Yeah, and trailing it on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> Given that this dress seems to be such a conspicuous display of wealth, I'm fascinated to find out more about the couple in the portrait and why they might have chosen these clothes to be painted in. I'm hoping art historian Jenny Graham can shed some light on the subject. So this portrait, one of the most contested, most debated in the history of Western art, who do we think these people are? They're a very wealthy couple. We know that they come from the Arnolfini family, who traded in luxurious fabrics and exotic items, such as the four oranges that you can see. This really represents their conspicuous consumption of wealth and splendid things. Now, this picture has become ensconced within popular culture. Even Charles Dickens refers to it as that strange mirror picture. Why do you think it's got such an enduring appeal? I can't think of another painting in sort of Western art history whereby we know so very much about how it's been interpreted in different ways over the years. It seems to be a painting which triggers all kinds of detective-like uh, attempts to solve the enigma, the riddle. One of the overriding theories that's now been discredited is that she's pregnant, but that's not the case, is it? No, the pregnancy theories first crop up in the 19th century, but a modern reading of the painting is very much that she is holding up the green wool dress, very, very heavy. And so the painting now is much more understood, I think, as a display of opulence and wealth. And it's more than that as well. It's very, very interesting in terms of gender politics. If she were to let go of the folds of the dress, it would pull out all around her in a way that would make it almost impossible to walk. And we know, for example, that there were lots of ways that women in this, at this time 
signaled their social status, the fact that they weren't going to be moving around or undertaking anything manual. Everything seems to signal restraint. So the dress we're seeing here represents a number of different things. It can speak to us about the position of women in society. It can speak to us about the couple, the status as merchants. So it really, there's an awful lot going on here, isn't there? Yes, I mean, interestingly, the green dress is made of wool, which was very much associated with trade between Bruges, where Jan van Eyck paints the portrait, and Italy. We know that the Arnolfini family traded in cloth particularly, so there's a sort of familial significance there. But green itself was a colour associated with high finance and banking. When one made a trade in um, Italy during this period, one would place down a green cloth. So I think there's a real significance given the trade in which they've made their money. Just as the painting's complexity provides continual debate for art historians, so the dress's design is proving a challenge for Ninja. I'm trying to work out how the sleeves on this Arnolfini gown actually work because they're incredibly complicated. If you go to the bottom of the strips, mm -hmm. see, look, isn't that the bottom edge of a strip? And that's the bottom edge oh, of a yeah. strip. So that's it's in, like there's layers. It's in tiers, isn't it? It's got a sort of fold at the bottom, hasn't it? Oh, Do that's the point. Maybe it's not a raw edge. Maybe it's folded. I don't think that is a raw edge. Look, it doesn't. It's not pink. The edge. The edge is is definitely different. That's not a pink edge. That's a fold. How about it's one piece that's really long and it's folded up behind itself and pinned. So that the, so it's behaving. the, the long things would come down to there and then fold mm -hmm. back up. Yeah, and that would give it more body so it would stay, it would give it, it that sort of flat front thing. I think that's worth a shot. <laughs> Need to do another twirl in something thicker. Yeah, how about if I cut it in wool and then we can cut mm -hmm. into it and see yes. how it behaves. Yes, it'll have more body, won't it? All Twice right. as big. Back to the drawing board. <laughs> <laughs> As we've seen, everything about this portrait screams status. Just the sheer amount of fabric in the gown could have caused offence at a time when strict sumptuary laws dictated what different classes of society could wear. As merchants, the Arnolfinis may have been rich, but they weren't nobility, and their ostentatious display of wealth was at odds with the rigid hierarchical society of the time. In Flanders, where they lived, one chronicler even blamed the outbreak of civil war just over 50 years earlier on the audacity of city dwellers who were better dressed than the nobles. And this attitude wasn't confined to Europe. In England, Geoffrey Chaucer wrote, May not a man see us in our days the sinful, costly array of clothing, and namely in too much superfluity that maketh it so dear to the harm of the people. But there is also the costly furring in their gowns, so much pouncing of chisel to make holes, so much dagging of shears, with a superfluity in length of the aforesaid gowns, trailing in the dung and in the mire. Wool was the primary fabric for clothing in the Middle Ages, but quality varied depending on whether it was for a peasant or a prince. English wools in particular were considered to be very high quality, and some could even be more expensive than silk. Our gown would have been made from the highest quality broadcloth, nowadays called doeskin. To find out more about the processes involved in making this fabric, I'm visiting a company that has been making doeskin for over 200 years. So you've got a bale this size, but when you unroll it, it'll actually oh my expand God. <laughs> to this. Wow. After arriving in tightly compacted bales, the wool is pulled apart and aerated in the blending process. So this is what it looks like when it comes off the, out of the machine. Yeah. So you can see how different it looks, how, how aerated and how pulled apart it is. Next, the aerated wool is sent to carding. This machine is going to take all of this yeah. to make it look like this. OK, and how does it do that? Carding is where the wool fibres are broken up and aligned into strands. That really does look like clouds or something. You can really see it, so 
starting to take that shape now. This is what you get out at the end. So this is what we call slubbing. If you pull it apart, you can see that there's no strength in there, but you can take the same piece and put all those twists in and turn it and turn it and turn it, and then try and pull it apart. You can see that you've got more strength in there. So that's yeah. the spinning process that we have to go through next to make it into the yarn that we can put through. The yarn is spun onto spools and then woven into cloth. The next process is what makes our wool so special. It's washed and beaten, which shrinks the cloth, meshing the fibres together, giving it its felt-like texture and enabling it to be cut without fraying. Then, tentering. So you know the saying tender hooks? Yes. Being kept on tender hooks, that's where this saying comes from. It would have been carried out into a field, it would have been pinned actually onto wooden A-frames and left out into the sun to dry. Yeah. Obviously it would have taken a very long time and therefore being kept on tenter hooks. Oh. But this is the modern day equivalent. So you see these holes? Yeah. That's where your tenter hooks are. Ah, oh. wow. <laughs> so this is your dough skin. Oh my God, so this uh, is it? So beautiful. Look I know. The colour. It's the sheen. Oh. It's the face of the fabric that gives it that beautiful, beautiful sheen. How exciting. I can't wait to see it made up. It's just incredible how many different stages this fabric has gone through to get it into this beautiful, finished state. And it's even more astounding to think that in the 15th century, each of these different stages would have actually been done by hand. It really goes to show just how expensive this fabric would have been. It was a real status symbol and a real show of wealth. Come and see how gorgeous it looks. Oh, wow. It could just make you cry, it's so beautiful. It? <laughs> it is. Gorgeous, look at it. It's like liquid, yeah, isn't it? Yeah, it's just what we wanted. It's, oh, it's so perfect. And amazing. I did have to think quite carefully about how to cut such a wide pattern piece from the wool. And it, it had to have pieces, extra pieces sewn into it. So we've got those pieces at the sides here. Oh, wow. And you can see how where they're upside down, the light falls completely differently yeah. on it. And nowadays, that's something we wouldn't find acceptable at all. Yeah. Yeah. But of course, you know, in the gown, you just, you just don't see it with the way it falls. Yeah, it just gets lost in the in the pleats and the folds. The, the real complex features of this gown are not there yet. So we've got the pinking in the sleeves and also there's all this very tight pleating in the front and back, I suspect, of the gown. I've done quite a lot of samples of the pinking because it's quite scary to go, you know, you can only cut once. <laughs> yeah. Oh. So I've done one strip here. Oh. It's quite effective, isn't it? It's really effective. But so exciting. It is exciting. Yeah. It's all, you know, it's all such experimental archaeology. It's brilliant. Yeah. You, know, you, don't, you don't make these things all the time and you can't possibly know all of the answers without just doing it, which is what we're doing. Would you like to have a go? <laughs> OK, yes. Yes, I would. Okay, sound like it might not have been hard enough. <laughs> I don't think I feel like it wasn't hard enough. Okay. Oh, there we go. Yay! Yeah, that worked. <laughs> well I think what this also really illustrates is it's the nature of the cloth that allows you to do this kind of technique and it... And it not fray. And it not yeah, fray and fall apart. Because... Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yay. Not to the end. Not to the end. <laughs> OK. Oh, look at that. Start to get a real feel for how delicate and yet how complex it looks, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. And then Harriet is working on a very exciting piece. This, and this really is it's so, it's it so is exciting. exciting. It doesn't look so exciting, but a drab linen. You know, one of the features of these gowns is the way they've got all these pleats mm. in, in the middle. We know from having tried to make these reconstructions in the past that you, you can almost achieve that look. And then as soon as the person moves, all the pleats move. And we've experimented with things like stay tapes and sewing the insides. And nothing's ever been quite as effective as we want it to be. Yeah. Linen, especially a sort of a rough canvassy linen like this, 
has got a lot more control stiff. about it. Yeah. yeah. What we're doing is just lightly stitching the linen down onto the wool. We don't credit tailors this early with um, mm. such ingenuity, and um, it's slightly embarrassing when you discover these technologies and you think they yeah. knew a lot more than we did. <laughs> they knew their fabrics really well. Really knew That's the fabric. The it's incredible the number of different mm. techniques that go into it. Haven't yeah. even got to the fur yet. There's quite a lot of it. <laughs> Whoa. And it's heavy. Oh my gosh. In fact, this is something I hadn't really considered is just how heavy this whole thing is going to be. Yeah. Because this yeah. fur on its own, if you lift that and see how heavy it is, and then we've got the wool on the top. Oh god. Yeah. <laughs> so is this the full amount of this is going to go into the dress? Yeah, because we've decided that the whole of those big sleeves must be lined in yeah. fur. And then most of this gown, which is probably why she's standing there like this. <laughs> <laughs> she's just she going, get, get, get like it off machine. me. <laughs> Dyeing was perhaps the most important of the finishing processes to give woolen cloth its final appearance. Blue dye had been common since the 14th century, and even peasants were likely to own a coloured gown. Deep shades, like those in our portrait though, were still hard to achieve. The colours in the Arnolfini picture are really important. We've got this real richness to the colours, and I think that it's all kind of bound up with the wealth and the status that's really on display in this picture. So I'm really keen to see if we can replicate those colours using the techniques that would have been around in the 15th century. I think it's going to be a really interesting experiment to find out. Debbie Bamford specialises in traditional dyeing techniques. So how common was green as a colour in the 15th century? Not as common. Green is a much more expensive colour because it's two dyes. It's the yellow and the blue. So the yellow dye is made from a plant called weld, or dyer's rocket, which is dried and broken up. If you'd like to take a string and tie that tightly round for me. Like this? Yes. So this goes in here? That just goes in there. Just, you just, just drop it in. Anything happening? No. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, look. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Now. The crucial bit. Weld responds very, very well to the addition of a little glug of this. So uh, hold okay. your nose. <laughs> Could you explain? I have a feeling yeah. that I might know what this is. Could you explain to me what this is? This is stale urine. This is minimum three week old urine, and I'm using it to modify the colour. Okay. So you can see this pale yellow there. Yeah. If I pour some of this in. This isn't giving the colour, it is now drawing the colour out of the line. Can you oh see gosh, how much that makes so much difference. Yeah. So if I put that in there with that now, you can see the yellow much more clearly on the cloth. Yeah. Now that's got to be heated up for a while, for about a quarter of an hour, 20 minutes, mm -hmm. and that should then start developing the colour. For blue, another plant called woad is used, which is dried and made into balls for storage. We have to dissolve it in an alkali. Right. So that's where the stale urine came in. And so the dye vat is actually made up with stale urine and the woad mess. It's kind of a dyer's best friend, oh, really, stale, stale urine, urine, isn't it? Yes. So we take the yellow piece out now. Ooh, OK. Look at that. That's really, really lovely colour. That's really quite a busy, vivid yellow, That's isn't it? lovely. That's one of my favourite colours. You want to put it, just slide it in very carefully. Oh, you like the smell of that one, don't you? <laughs> and that really just smells yeah. unpleasant, doesn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the more times it's gone back in the dye bath, the more expensive the colour gets. Right. If you want a dark green, you're going to go in two or three times. Mm -hmm. If you want a green like you're wearing, or like we're talking in the, this particular painting, then yes, that is, I've got some status and I've got some wealth. That's so interesting. I didn't realise that the strength of the colour sort of determined the price. I mean, it mm. makes perfect sense. Do you want to take the yellow out of the blue? Yeah, yes, so this, we're thing. hoping that this we're is going to be our green. green. Yeah, OK. Oh, oh my God. God. <laughs> <laughs> It's just so horrible. 
It looks gorgeous. Oh, look at that. It's changing colour in the air. It's pretty much getting to the same colour as my top. I did not realise that it had that kind of reaction to the air. That's it's really exciting yeah, that it moment, is. isn't it? Yeah. That is an amazing colour. That's gorgeous, isn't it's it? It's a beautiful green, isn't it? And you can see how that is getting you the colour for the Arnolfini. Absolutely. Gown, yeah. It's so interesting. I think if it wasn't for the smell, <laughs> I would have been very happy being a medieval tire. <laughs>while well, 15th century dyeing techniques still produce incredible results, Ninja is finding not all traditional methods fit quite so well with modern life. What we've now got to do is wait for the hot plate to heat up and then the hot plate to heat the iron up. In the, the tailor's shop in Arnolfini's time, his apprentice would have set all this up, the coals and the brazier, early on in the day, and one of his tasks would then be to maintain that heat and make sure that the, the heat of the iron was never interrupted so the tailor wasn't inconvenienced. <laughs> so that, you know, we're doing everything by hand as it would have been done in Arnolfini's time, and this is really the only real inconvenience of early tools because all the other tailoring tools that we use really haven't changed very much since the 15th century. There we are. I can hand it over to Hannah, who's preparing at the moment the edging for the sleeve slits. Like so? Yeah, it's good. That is the last slit. Ooh. <laughs> oh, that's really nice. It's gorgeous, isn't it? Yeah. It's ready to put the furry linings in. Yeah, they're not ready yet, sorry. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if we didn't steam it, because the nature of the wool is that it's very bouncy, which is what's really beautiful about the nature of the fabric, means that it wouldn't stay in the place fanning out like that that we wanted to. As soon as the wearer moved around, the pleats would shift. Whereas because they're stitched to this canvas and then they're steamed into place so that the fibres have moulded around those pleats, that lovely fan shape that um, Harriet's actually arranged should stay. Just sending the steam down into the pleats, aren't we? Nice. Yeah. Lovely. Look at that. It's like a peacock's tail, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Really beautiful. It's exactly it's right. Brilliant. Good. They're even better. They are. It's great seeing them moving. <laughs> <laughs> it looks so much like the painting. <laughs> I can't get over this. It's just incredible. And it's so heavy. It feels yeah. insanely luxurious. Does it? Really That's luxurious. Good. So it, can you actually walk, do you think? If you grab a handful of the stuff so that you can actually not tread, that's it. Oh, it's very elegant. Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> That's really exciting. And it gives you that stance that yeah. she has in the painting as well, doesn't it? Which is really interesting. Maybe part of that stance is to do with the weight of the fabric. It, Balancing yeah. it. Yeah. That's, that's being held. It's, you know, you have to kind of lean back to be able to get purchase on the, yeah. on the weight <laughs> of the fabric. Well, it's a constant reminder of your wealth, yeah. isn't it? This is so heavy, I've got so much money. That's yeah. good, that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the sleeves are just absolutely phenomenal. It didn't occur to me that they would 
make you want to do that. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> basically. That they would be so kind of fluid. It's that sort of fluidity that the whole thing has. But that's what you just can't get from a portrait. In a portrait, as a maker, you always want to say, could you just lift your arm? Could you just do that? <laughs> yeah. and, and then you would see what was going on, and we yeah. can't do that. With... Yeah, it really gives it life, doesn't it, to yeah. have a real human person in it. <laughs> <laughs> And not too hot? I mean, it's, it's quite hot. <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, at this period in the 15th century, it's basically what the period that's known as the Mini Ice Age. This is a time when the River Thames regularly froze thick enough that you could have whole frost fairs frost on fair. it. It makes a lot more sense when you take away central heating and reduce yeah. the temperature outside by a few degrees. Yeah. A lot of and heat being you generated. are a lady of leisure. If you're a labouring woman, you would keep a lot warmer, but you're spending a lot of your time just sitting or standing, and so you would definitely need these kinds of layers. Yeah, and swishing. And swishing. I would just obviously. spend all my time swishing. If you needed swishing. to warm up any more, you just do a bit of swishing and <laughs> yeah. then sit down again. <laughs> yeah, it's just fantastic. This experiment has been really fascinating. What surprised me about seeing the gown, I think, is really how bulky it is, how much fabric and how much fur there is. It must have cost an absolute fortune. This idea of wealth and status is really rammed home. She really becomes a symbol of these new types of wealth, these new types of people who are buying and selling, who are trading at this time. It also is incredibly fascinating in terms of the female body ideal as well that was prevalent in the 15th century. So having an idea and understanding of what this feels like to create this is, is just invaluable. It's no surprise that the earliest painting in the National Portrait Gallery is of a king. It was hugely expensive to commission a portrait, but by the 18th century, rising prosperity meant that more people were able to preserve their likeness. However, it was still really unusual for people to commission a portrait of their workers. The history of fashion and also the history of art largely tell us stories about elite groups of people. If you were wealthy enough to have your portrait painted, you were also most likely wealthy enough to be following the latest fashions. But if I'd been alive in the 18th century, I wouldn't have been dressed like a queen or you know, even like a noblewoman. So I'm interested to find out more about the clothing that people like me would have been wearing. That's why I'm so intrigued by this rare full-length portrait of a hedge cutter and I'm really interested to see what Ninja makes of it. Hello. Hello. Thanks. So this portrait is really fascinating. It's unusual in art history mm. and quite unusual in fashion history. What are your thoughts on what is being worn here? I think there are clues to what's going on. It's difficult to see in the reproduction that we've got. It's very dark, isn't it? It is this really portrait. dark. But you can just about, like you say, make out some details. Like, this looks a bit like a mariner's cuff. I agree. Here. And actually, Harriet did this sketch to help bring out some of the details and make it easier to see, and we picked up on that as well. What that suggests is that this coat was once a very smart and fashionable garment. What's likely is that the original person was some generations before, perhaps a yeoman gentleman, maybe, and he would have passed it down to someone slightly below him in status, and it's probably filtered down um, two, three, four times, maybe, before this, this man actually got it. And what are our thoughts on what this is being crafted from? We think that it's most likely to have been leather, actually. It was a, both a fashionable um, fabric, but also, more importantly, as far as this hedge cutter is concerned, a very functional fabric. We actually have an original garment here made from leather, if you'd like to have a look. I would love to have a look. These actually belong to my brother-in-law, <laughs> okay. who is an avid collector of um, military clothing. So these are actually original Napoleonic leather trousers. Oh, wow. Which oh we can God. use to help us get an idea about how we might use the material and actually construct the garment. Wow, these are incredible. Aren't they? The other striking thing about the portrait is that the jacket itself looks kind of patched together. It's 
Very striking. Is that sort of years and years of repairs? Yes, well, you can see that it not only is it patched, but it's very, very tattered. The stitching of the patches is really incredibly crude. Mm. And I think that maybe the hedge cutter himself might have sewn those patches on as required. How do the patches figure into this? Are we going to make it with the patches? Well, what I'd be really keen to do is actually to reconstruct the coat as it would have looked when it was, when it was new, because I think it's going to look really quite different from the way it's ended its life, and it would be great to have that illustration of the, the beginning and the, what I presume would be pretty near to the end of this garment's yeah. life. So that's what I'd like to do. OK, great. So we get to see it as almost an, an evolution. Mm, yeah, I think that's exciting. I think it's going to be a very nice coat. <laughs> right. <laughs> Our hedge cutter is something of a mystery. His image has been preserved for over 200 years, and yet no one knows who he is. We're not even entirely sure when the portrait was painted or who it was by. I want to learn more about the painting, and so I'm meeting art historian Florence Evans at Broughton Castle, where the portrait has been owned by the Fines family for generations. So, here we have it. My goodness. I knew it was going to be large, but it really is quite monumental, isn't it? It is. Monumental is a good, yeah. way, a good way to describe it, I think, definitely. Mm. Now, as a fashion historian, it's proven quite difficult to date this portrait based on the clothing mm -hmm. because we think it's something that may have been repurposed time and time again. Mm -hmm. Now, what are your thoughts on this as an art historian? And the aesthetic is harking towards the 19th century. Whoever painted it has experimented and used bitumen in the black pigments. Right. And that was quite an innovative and new way of getting a rich, dark tone in your paintings. Stylistically, the way it's been handled, I really do feel that it's from certainly the 1780s, probably the 1790s. The cuffs suggest that it's an earlier date, but you would expect a labourer to have clothes that were passed down and mended and endure over decades. And is there anything else about this portrait that you think can help us to date it? If you look at the pipe that he's smoking, now clay pipe bowls um, are very easily datable by their shape and size. And in the mid 18th century, for instance, they had a rather elongated bowl. And here he has a rather chubbier bowl, which makes me think it's later 18th century and pointing again towards the 19th century. It's really unusual to have a portrait on this scale of a member of staff, someone who's working here. Yeah. Is there anything comparable that you know of? Well, in 1790, Thomas Barker of Bath did a series of life-size portraits of pastoral figures, which caused quite a furore at the time. Were people just so unused to seeing working people depicted in this way? Yes, on this scale it was very unusual and it would have been startling to an 18th century viewer, really, when they were expecting to see polite society on their walls. And that's really the first time you see that, and in fact actually it's the first time I've seen one on this scale myself, and it really is amazing, as it would have been at the time. It's great to hear that Florence would situate the painting of the portrait in the late 18th century, because if we are looking at something that was painted in the 1790s, then that really tells us a whole lot in many ways about what's being worn here. Ninja and I had already discussed the fact that the mariner's calf dates from much earlier in the 18th century, around the middle or the 1760s. So if the portrait is from the 1790s, we really get a clear sense that our subject is wearing a garment that is most likely to be second-hand. Very few people can afford to get these clothes made new. Textiles, clothing are some of the most valuable things that people can own at this point in history. And we've really lost a sense of this in the 21st century. We're so used to clothing being a disposable commodity. One of the distinctive features of the coat is its patches, but they're causing problems for Ninia and Harriet. I've made a toile for a coat from the 1750s that carries a mariner's cuff, so I've drawn the mariner's cuff on. Oh, yeah. Very attractive, but I've also pinned on some patches where we can see them. It's rather interesting where they sit, because in the painting you can't see 
no, the shoulder seam. Uh, and that's been really bothering me that you yeah. can't see the shoulder seam, but I think it's conceivable that the patch that's right there is just masking yeah. all of it because there must be a shoulder seam there. Yes, of course. But obviously, if, if you've been throwing your, your body through a, a hedge with yeah. thorns, that's probably going to yeah, be a, a big think... point of wear. Well, and also, I'm really struck by the fact that this, this whole area of patching is exactly where a pocket yeah. would be, isn't it? And it even yeah. looks like a pocket flap. It's it, like he's tried to replace the pocket flap, caught it on a, on a, a hedge and ripped it, perhaps. Yeah, but somehow the, the toile underneath the patches is really hinting at what's potentially a very smart yes. coat underneath. If we look at that side of it, and you can just see the, the, it's That's got the lovely, lovely isn't pleated it? And back. I guess he'd have a button up here. He would, there. yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's actually quite a beautiful it shape. Is. These it coats really... are classic. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to want to keep this coat. <laughs> <laughs> Shall I make it to fit you? <laughs> Let's see how much is in here. Oh, it's quite a good hide. So the, the, the skin here, along the what would have been the spine of the animal, mm. is the strongest part. Yes, it's, it's so... It's still got a good stretch to it, oh, but yeah. it's, it's nice and thick. And you can see the edge there is much, much puckered. Yeah, it's much thinner and, and also, yeah, as you say, it's puckered and crinkled. So this is where we should actually take things like buttons and bindings, bindings yeah. facings, things like that, because it will be much easier to yeah. sew. We really have to think quite carefully when you're cutting leather, don't you, about which bits you're going to end up sewing in which way. But there's also the joy that because we're, we're going to butt the seams together, we don't have to allow any sort of seam allowance. Well, it's a very helpful straight edge along the backbone, isn't it? It is, although have we, we haven't got enough straight edge to get all four pieces, have we? We might have if we're very careful. But this is a good big piece, so we should be fine. The Fashion and Textiles collection at the v &A Museum contains over 75,000 objects. Fashion curator Susan North is going to show me a garment that could shed a light on the early life of our hedge cutter's coat. So what we have here is a great example of a frock coat. What's the provenance of this? Well, it's a, a rather informal style of coat. This one probably dates from about the 1750s, although the style comes in earlier. The first examples that we see show up in the 1730s. This coat is actually kind of emblematic of the second-hand trade, isn't it? Because there's also a label in here for a costumier. Yes! Which yes. is very exciting, I think, to be able to see a couple of different lives that this coat has had. Absolutely. What we've discovered about the 19th century theatre, uh, at least in London, uh, was that when you look at photographs of actors in costume, say, from the 1870s, and they're, they're in a production that's 18th century. And they're wearing real 18th century clothing. Mm. And it was probably cheaper to go down to Seven Dials and buy something that fit you than it was to hire a tailor to make something for you. And of course, this is a time when the actor is responsible for his costume. He's got to pay for it. And one of the reasons I chose this portrait was because I was really keen to explore more everyday dress, like something that someone like me maybe would have been wearing. Now, it's very, very difficult to actually find that out through museum collections. So why do you think there is that lack of working dress. Most of the fashion museums obviously want the glamorous things, um, so that's part of the bias. But then the other bias is what people save. We tend to save the most expensive things, the most beautiful things. Most working class clothing would have gone through five, six life cycles, getting ever more bedraggled to a point where really the only person who's interested in it is the rag man. Now the rag man buys linen and cotton that's just really too decrepit for anything. He takes it away and they make paper out of it. He gets money for it. Even when it was a rag, there was somebody who was willing to pay you for it. And anything we do have, I would say, really is an accident. It's benign neglect. Somebody forgot to recycle this. Lucky for us. Uh, lucky for <laughs> us. The 
Hedge Cutter is such a fantastic character. We really get a sense of his personality in the portrait. So I'm looking forward to seeing his clothing come to life in 3D form. Now in the painting, of course, his clothing is old, it's dirty, it's used, it's patched. So seeing it as it would have been when it was a brand new garment is going to be quite fascinating. It's also going to be interesting from a practical perspective for me to have a go working with leather. It's not something I've ever worked with before, so that is going to be quite eye-opening. So what's going on? Well, this might sound a bit weird, but my brother-in-law's trousers have been speaking to me quite a lot. <laughs> <laughs> for the last few days. They have lots to tell me. Yeah, right. <laughs> Let's see if they'll share any information with you. Looking carefully, I can see that there's very particular seam treatments for very particular areas. Right. You see this seam here? Yeah, How this it's... around here looks yeah. very complicated. It's a seam called a butt stitch, right. which um, you see more normally on much thicker leather. And it's where you need the leather to just butt up one edge to the other. Yeah. The way we actually sew the butt seam is that the holes have to be made in the leather first. Right. The hole is going through the top and out the, the side uh, of the leather, out the middle. Crikey. Which is why you, that you're then able to kind of butt the edges together like that. So the first thing you have to do is use an awl, which is this tool here. It's like a kind of pointed blade. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to push the hole from the side and then slide it out like that. And that takes a bit of practice. Yeah, it looks really difficult. Yeah, and it's quite easy to tear a leather that's this thin. thin. Gosh. So, okay. let's try one in the actual sleeve. I guess, okay. So. Oh. Yeah, that's good. Am I going too far? My holes seem to be bigger than... No, that's fine, because it kind of closes back, back again. I'm slightly losing the straightness of the line that you had. OK, well, let's stop there. Would you, like, <laughs> <laughs> would you like to try actually sewing them together? OK. So here I've got one piece of thread with a needle on each end. Right. So this needle is going to go in that hole there. This one yep. here? And before you pull too tight, put that needle down. <laughs> Pick this one up. Yeah. So this one is going to go back through that same hole that you've just sewn through. <laughs> yeah, I've done it. Okay, and then you can pull the two threads away from each other to, to get the tension and tighten it up. You probably have to pull it quite close to the leather, that's it. Okay. Gosh, that's an awful lot of work, isn't it? To, to join two bits mm. of leather together. Okay, fun as this has been, <laughs> I might leave the rest of it to you Are for you now. Sure? I'm, I'm sure, yeah. Well, that's nice of you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so I'm keen to see what you're up to over here. This looks very exciting. Yes, it's nice when you start to get the, the, the finished garment coming out. Now, we did debate whether to have the edges just left raw because leather doesn't fray and it would have made sense to just have the pocket flap made without any sort of binding on it. Yeah. But when Guess you look what at happened? that... <laughs> uh, brother in law's trousers. The trousers <laughs> speaking to you too. They said, yes. excuse me, <laughs> that's wrong. <laughs> yeah, it, if you remember when you looked at the edge of the fly flap, yeah. it's got a bound edge made with the same leather. Yeah. And so we've done that with the pockets right. and it, it's made it much stronger and it just, it looks... It looks lovely, right, doesn't, doesn't it? it? It looks really nice. Yeah. Lovely. So the binding gets stitched on as you would with a, a, a cloth binding. You stitch on one side and then turn it over and stitch oh, the other nice. side down. Oh. And when you've done that, it's a little bit bulky. So we don't do it with an iron, we do it with a hammer. Oh, so, that's exciting. <laughs> yeah, that is exciting. <laughs> it is exciting. It's quite satisfying because it, it, it melds the, all the, the bits of leather in together. Right. So I haven't done this one yet. 
but you can see where it's sort of folded into the corners, it's still quite big and bulky, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if you oh, just look. hammer it flat like that, it immediately it makes such sits a difference, down. doesn't it? Yeah, really nice. Do you feel? Yeah, go on then. Great. Good. You can see it sort of yeah. flattening out, can't you? That is exciting. It is. It's <laughs> That's a really, really good fun. It's a quick result. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's ah, immediately Look exciting. at that. So great. It's lovely. It's all that's enough, Amber. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all of the effects of ironing, but much more yeah. fun. <laughs> Not only do we have very few portraits of working people, but we have even fewer surviving examples of what they wore. But what we do have is an amazing collection of 18th century everyday textiles from here at the Foundling Museum. What we are seeing here are records of children um, often babies who were left at the foundling hospital. Much of the time when they were left, they would be accompanied by a textile token. This could be part of the mother's clothing or maybe a specific textile. But the purpose of it was so that if the mother found herself in better circumstances, she could return and identify her child by this textile token. 25th of June, 1764, female. Now, what we can see here is a beautiful example of an 18th century printed cotton textile. But then stitched onto it, on the back, is this heart shape on cardboard. It says, Anne Smith was born January the 4th. 1764. John Bedford, Anna Chamber, Elizabeth Hoadley, Susan Larratt, Sarah Henley, Catherine Thomas, Francis Summers, Charles Mallet, Mary John Payne. The collection is hugely historically important. What we can see here is a lot of printed cotton textiles, which were becoming more and more fashionable as manufacturing techniques improved and enhanced. These replicate the embroidered patterns that you could see at this time on very expensive Spitalfield silks. So this is almost like the equivalent of the high street designer knockoff. We're used to associating fashionable dress with court circles, the aristocracy throughout history. But now we're really beginning to see that members of the urban poor are able to start engaging in this fledgling consumer society as well. From a historian's perspective, this collection is just absolutely invaluable. What we're left with here is about 5,000 textile swatches and it's now the largest collection of everyday 18th century textiles that we have in the country. From a human perspective, it's actually a very difficult collection to look through. Just the hope that is bound up in these. Less than 1% of mothers were able to return and reclaim their children from the foundling hospital. But what we can see here is that so many of them really had the belief that they would be able to come back. While cheap printed cottons meant that working people had a choice of fabrics for the first time, our hedge cutter was looking for function rather than fashion. So we've been working with this leather and discussing how soft and pliable and beautiful it is and actually questioning its defensive properties. So I thought I'd come to the back of my garden where I know there is a really viciously spiky rose and I'm just going to see whether it actually tears if I give it a good go on these spikes. So let's see. 
Oh. I'm going to pretend we're really getting into this hedge. Oh. Right, so we can see there's lots of scratch marks, but nothing like anywhere near tearing, which is really interesting. It's still, it's still really intact. You can imagine that after repeated days and weeks and months of going in and out of hedges, you might get a particularly vicious one that would finally go through a very worn patch, but that's impressive, actually. And what's happened is it's actually broken off the tops of a lot of these thorns. The leather has done more damage to the rose than the rose has done to the leather, <laughs> which is really interesting. So what I'm doing here I'm attaching my pre-covered buttons to the front of the coat so that the pocket flap can be fastened. The base of the button would have been either horn or wooden. So I just put a circle around, gather it up and then stitch it in place. Like with anything, your first button is always the worst button and then you get quicker and also better. Luckily, my worst button isn't terribly chunky, but it, you can tell that it is chunkier because it sits on one side rather than central. So now it's the moment of truth. Having lived for so long with the shreds and patches of our hedge cutter's coat, it'll be intriguing to discover what it would have looked like in its pristine state. Look at that. Oh, wow, look at that. Oh, the back is amazing. And also that, just that particular 18th century men's shoulder as well. It doesn't have any of the squareness that we associate with men's jackets today, does it? It's mu a much rounder look. It's kind of interesting because it shows how our ideas about sort of manliness and masculinity changes, doesn't it? I'm just so surprised by how soft it is already. I thought it was something that would need to be worn in, but it's actually really easy to move. I was impressed how, how thin the leather can be and still do the things that, that we wanted it to in a defensive way. Oh, it's absolutely beautiful, isn't it? I remember hammering some yeah. of these, yeah. Yeah, I love those mariner's cuffs though. It's just yeah. such a great detail. Isn't it's a it? really great detail, isn't it? Really great detail. This leather, when new, has this kind of bright, soft, yellow, light colour, yeah. which we don't see in the portrait. And this kind of leather, over time, being outdoors in the sun, getting oil from hands and stains and everything, would have become much, much darker. Yeah. Um, so, Give that another 40 years or so, and the colour, the yeah. tone of it would change quite a lot. Well, I think that just adds even more weight to this idea that it was definitely a second-hand garment, doesn't it? I love the movement when you swoosh. <laughs> I wasn't expecting it to be so swooshy. <laughs> I, I must admit, I thought there would be no swoosh at all. <laughs> I'm pleasantly surprised. I feel like I don't want to take it off. It just immediately does become like a second skin and you could kind of do anything in it. Coat for life. A coat for life. Well, coat yeah. for many lives. It's very Indeed. now. <laughs> yeah. I really wanted to investigate the clothing of working people. Clothing that regular people, the majority of the population would have been wearing. Seeing this coat in the flesh has been invaluable because it's absolutely reinforced our theory that this is a second-hand garment. The fact that this likely didn't come new to the hedge cutter is really clear when we see it. It's an exquisitely made coat. It's unlikely that a working man would acquire something that's such a light colour that would immediately get very, very dirty. And it just feels very elegant to wear as well. This is something I would totally wear today. It's really very dapper indeed. The Black Prince, hero to the English, villain to the French. 
a warrior whose premature death in 1376 denied him the crown by just 12 months. Here he lies in his tomb at Canterbury Cathedral, immortalised by a gilded copper effigy. It's really powerful. You can see why you would want this monument to be your effigy, to be the worldly reminder of who you were. I've chosen the Black Prince's effigy here as our inspiration for a number of reasons. The 14th century is really important in terms of fashion history. It's a period where we start to dress differently. It's a period that some historians think the actual idea of fashion itself really begins, this idea of perpetually changing styles. Having won his first battle at only 16, this warrior prince chose to be represented in death as a heroic military leader, dressed in full armour covered with a type of tabard known as a jupon, richly embroidered with his personal heraldry. The jupon is a fascinating garment. It's a military item, but also a very fashionable item as well. People tend to think that there's this distinction between military dress and fashionable dress, but in reality, the relationship between the two is much more symbiotic. What's also fascinating is that we actually have an extant version of the Black Prince's jupon. It was hung here in Canterbury Cathedral for centuries. So having that extant garment as evidence is gonna be invaluable in terms of recreating this piece. by the most fashionable men of the day. But it's not an area I usually study, so I'm being given a tour of the arms and armoury department of the Wallace Collection by curator Toby Capwell. When people tend to think of armour, they think of metal, they think of plate armour and they think of mail. Mm -hmm. But actually textiles are a fundamental aspect yeah. of a suit of armour. Armour is just anything protective that you wear. It is not necessarily made out of metal. In the 14th century, they couldn't make big pieces of iron and steel yet. So they had to find other ways of protecting the human body. Padded textile is the most important form of armor. It's the most fundamental form of protection. It's what you need before you have anything else. We always fixate on the metal bits mm. because those are what survive. So in the time of the Black Prince, what's the role of heraldry in these kinds of garments? when you've got lots of guys in armor with their faces obscured and big shields on horses running around, you need to be able to tell who is who. And this was hugely important for leaders like the Black Prince. Seeing the leader on the front lines has an extraordinary uh, effect on morale. Imagine being a common soldier and your leader fights on the ground with you, right next to you. That's an extraordinary statement. One early 15th century writer, not long after the death of the Black Prince, wrote that men follow their leader like a candle in the dark. Right. And the heraldry is the flame of the candle. As a piece of textile armor, the extant jupon would have been padded. This means it differs slightly from the one depicted on the effigy, which although it would have been identical in terms of colors and embroidery, was silk and purely for heraldic display. In his will, the Black Prince asked to have his military jupon hung above his tomb. It was clearly a significant garment for him, so Ninja has decided to make our jupon to its exact specifications. I think it would be really fascinating to see how the garment looks in real life as the complete new thing, because I think it will give us a real sense of the man. Tell me about this embroidery. How difficult is it going to be to recreate this? Uh, it is a challenge because, of course, it, it would all be done by hand um, by professionals who worked in the royal wardrobe and there aren't nearly so many professional hand embroiderers around yeah. today. But I do have a team of uh, hand embroiderers that I have worked with before who've always done really lovely work and I'm sure we can send something to them. So the whole thing is it, it's padded. What's inside this? These kind of padded armours could be stuffed with sheep's fleece, with tow, which is like a raw linen flaxy fibre, um, but also cotton. And I've got some actually down here. 
Oh, right. Oh, so yes. that's just the raw cotton fibre. You can see how this would make fantastic stuffing. Can't yeah, you? it's actually, it's very, very soft, but once it's forced inside these tightly worked rows of quilting, then it becomes very robust. I think what we're going to have to do is a few experiments with different ways that we could carry out the quilting. Sort of trial and error. Yeah. Yeah. Experimental okay. archaeology. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> The son of Edward III and father to Richard II, the prince himself remains an enigma. I'm meeting historian David Green in the Black Prince's Chapel at Canterbury Cathedral to find out more about this intriguing and complex man. Where does this name come from? Was he known as the Black Prince during his lifetime? No, the first mention that we've got of him as the Black Prince is mid 16th century. There are two main theories. One is his so-called arms of peace. They're essentially his tournament arms. They're the three ostrich feathers on a black field, and so there could be a connection there. Or it could be a much more negative association, perhaps one that comes from France. He wages some extremely brutal military campaigns. In particular, there's one in 1355, the so-called Grand Chevauchet. A chevauchet is a sort of deliberate piece of socio-economic warfare. In the course of that, he's said to destroy something like 500 towns, villages, castles, and other settlements. So this is really calculated stuff. It's aimed at the peasantry. It's aimed at those who are in many ways least capable of defending themselves. It's designed to undermine the credibility of the French monarchy, but also to undermine the French king's ability to put troops into the field. That's brutal, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's absolutely brutal. So it's not impossible that that sort of reputation gets associated with the prince and he gets this name. I get the feeling from what I've learned about the Black Prince that he might enjoy that kind of representation. I think in some ways, and I think again the tomb is an interesting representation of this, probably one of the best ways of getting some sort of insight into the character of the man. He was quite a fashionable man, Would you, is that fair to say? Yeah, very much so, uh, and particularly perhaps when he marries Joan of Kent. They're caught at Bordeaux from 1363 until he comes back in 1370. Is extremely lavish and in fact the first person who gets commissioned to come over and join him is essentially his tailor and dressmaker. Oh fantastic. So. Now the effigy itself as an artwork and as a memorial as well, um, how important would it have been for it to be lifelike as a representation? Not as important as we might think of it today. Most effigies seem to have much more concern given to things like heraldry and arms and armour rather than a personal representation. But I hope it looks a bit like him. He has a very splendid moustache. He does, <laughs> indeed. The quilting is an essential feature of our jupon, as it would have played an important part in withstanding attack from arrows, crossbows and swords. Without any record of how the original was made, Ninja and Harriet still aren't sure which method to use. I've tapped my square all the way round, and I'm going to sew channels. I'm trying the, the different method where I've got, I've got a big cushion of the wadding in here. I'm going to sandwich the layers together and then stitch the lines. It doesn't look like it's going to be quite so successful as the other method. There's no other way of, of properly understanding how these things worked than, than to begin the process of making them. It, it's the only way to ask the right questions, really. You can't possibly think of all the questions until you begin to try and reconstruct something. Because these were, were items that are worn, you have to experiment like that, or else because it's not just a piece of art. I have had so many experiences of trying to fathom out an original set of instructions for doing something and thinking, surely that's not, that can't be right, that can't be right, and then trying it and going, oh, it was right. <laughs> they did know what they were talking about. And it can really surprise you, even when you're quite experienced and you think you know how something will turn out. Until you've given it a go, you often you just can't tell. It's almost comical, your piece, Harry. <laughs> It's rude. Of, it did, but it rude. looks it looks quite rude itself. I think the whole thing's just going to be completely dense and Squishy. still very yeah, still very fat and just not very defined. I 
I've now finished my piece, but it's not very satisfying because it looks a bit stiff and not very defined. So far, this method is making me think, yeah, could do that. The only difference is that this one is fat underneath the stitching lines and that one goes straight down. But then I put a lot of stuffing in there. There's probably I think there too is much. too much stuffing. But even so, there's no way you can get down to the base, which, which creates that lovely mm. sausagey definition. I did have great hopes for that. And it's nicely strong. I could stand in that while being shot at by arrows, possibly, mm. but that just makes the velvet look nicer. Hung above the Black Prince's tomb after his funeral, the Dupont stayed there until World War II. Due to its extremely delicate state, it's now carefully conserved at Canterbury Cathedral. Garments, textiles this old are so incredibly rare and it's very unusual that you're gonna be able to get access to see them. You have to have a very special reason. And so this is really a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm very excited. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really excited to see it. Since the Jupon was taken off display, only a handful of people have been allowed to see it. One of these is textile historian Lisa Monas. Oh, wow. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's incredible, isn't it? Considering it's over 600 years old, it's rather magnificent. Wow. It was the most magnificent velvet originally, which was one of the most expensive materials you could buy at the time. It was an incredible status symbol because it was very labour intensive. They used the finest materials and it was also a personalised design made especially for him. You can still see the fleur de lis, which were part of the royal arms of France, and the leopards of England. These are so important for the jupon because, of course, they presented the arms of the Black Prince. The blackened um, fleur de lis and lions that you see are all made with gold thread. The whole thing might have cost 20 pounds, and that would be a whole year's salary for one of the senior officers in the King's household. Wow, so this is absolutely something that speaks of wealth, magnificence, status, royalty. Yes, it's ostentatious in every way, in fact. <laughs> What I really would love to know is, would this have been created specifically for the funeral or would it actually have likely to have been in the Black Prince's wardrobe? I think this was undoubtedly something that he would have worn himself, which is very thrilling. Wow. Um, because it's so high quality and it is so, the details are so fine. So what can this Dupont tell us essentially about the Black Prince? He was a man who liked to project uh, a splendid image, but who wanted to be seen as someone who was a man of action, who was a, 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 sh a chivalrous warrior. And it can also tell us that he was quite tall and very lithe from its measurements. <laughs> right. So you would expect that from a man who was an energetic man of action. Following their experiment, Ninja and Harriet believe the best method for the quilting is to sew channels and then fill them. But having been able to study the actual garment, Lisa's not so sure. As far as one can tell, yeah. I think that it would be the second construction, which feels a bit softer, but which does have the advantage that the cotton wool padding goes right through, because when it's stuck in like this, not only is it rigid, but you have points of vulnerability where the channels go right through to the, the linen. So this may have a deceptively better defensive quality to it and it's possible that it was this method that they used. OK, so this is the one, this is yes. the one we're going with? Yes, definitely. That is That's fantastic to know. Great. It's incredible that what is essentially just some velvet and raw cotton could be tailored into a garment which may well have helped save the Black Prince's life. And so, although our Dupont will never be worn on the battlefield, I do feel a responsibility to get this absolutely right. Here's our big pile of cotton. Yeah. And you just want to pull bits off and put them in the basket until we get to 106. 106, OK. That's quite a lot, actually, it is a isn't lot. it? What have you got there? 44. Yeah. There's loads. <laughs> There's so much that goes into it, isn't there? No yeah. wonder it's such a protective yeah. Yeah. piece of clothing. How's that? 106, perfect. perfect. So this amount it is goes one in here, yeah. Half of a, a body. We just separate it out a little bit. What we're aiming to do is get as even a, a 
a distribution of the cotton over the pattern piece as possible. So we lay it out kind of relatively thinly within these lines. So if you'd like to take some and have a go as well, what we'll do is we'll, we'll layer it rather than trying to put it all down in one go, yeah. which would make lumps and troughs. We'll do one thin layer and then we'll go back and do another one and hopefully our little patches overlap and kind right. of even out a little bit. I see, okay. Okay, I can, I can get on board with this. <laughs> this is quite enjoyable. When we've got all of this on, we can actually put the layer of velvet. I've got the piece of velvet ready here to put on the top. Yeah. And um, I can start the quilting. But if you have a look at what Hannah's doing, she's actually nearly finished, actually, I think, one of her body yeah. pieces. And you can see how it looks at the next stage. OK, great. So you're doing the quilting process. I am. How's it going? It's going quite well, to be honest. I started with this line here. This was my very, very first line. Yeah. And then I worked this line. And then that one. Oh, I so see. So all to the keep time I'm evenly, spreading it. Yeah. yeah, evenly spaced. Yeah. Would you like to have a go at quilting? I would love to have a go at quilting. Yeah, definitely. So, going in here. Yeah. That about that size? Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. It is quite hard to push yeah. all the way through. Okay. No, it's this coming back. It's difficult to know. You can't sense exactly where you're going to go. It's only when no. you get into a rhythm. Oh, that's that's my finger. <laughs> <laughs> no. So if we just have a look underneath to see how straight oh, that God. line is. It is really hard to sort of sense how straight you're pushing the needle through the fabric and the wadding and then the velvet as well. Yeah, mm. so my attempt here is not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Good. Knights like the Black Prince would have started their military education around the age of five. So Toby Capwell is giving me some armour training to help me understand this fighting prince. I am wearing tracky bees and I'm wearing sneakers, which has never happened before. So I'm feeling pretty, pretty prepped, pretty ready for it. A knight would have worn 20 kilograms of armour, which would have had a huge impact on mobility. I don't know what I was expecting, but of course, of course you can feel weight absolutely all over you. These muscles especially, yes. right on the outside, they're not used to having to lift so much weight. Those muscles when you're fighting are too. not used to doing anything, I'll be honest. <laughs> we do now have the helmet. This right. is exactly what we see in the effigy. Open-faced, no visor, high, sharp point to deflect weapons, and uh, the aventail of mail. We'll put you in here and you'll be, you'll be ready to go. Okay. Hopefully. There you go. It's a little bit deep for you. Yeah. But you want, oh you, want, you want it to come as close to your eyes as possible to keep your brow protected, so. I feel yeah. like if I, I, if I lent over, uh -huh. I'd just keep going. How, so how much does all of this weigh that I'm wearing now? We might be at 10 or 12. That's all? Something so like that. So I'd have that. another like eight to yeah. 10, I'd have like twice this again. Yeah, well you'd have the male shirt and the leg armor, which is gonna get you up to 20 kilos or more. Now imagine, not only do you have to just hold yourself upright, you need to be able to fight, you need to be able to run, jump on your horse, climb siege ladders, cross rivers. You need to be able to do physically quite strenuous activity. Yeah, I guess you need to wear it so much that it becomes second nature, like a second yeah. skin. Yeah. The 14th century French knight Boussicot recorded his training regime, which included leaping onto a horse while wearing armour. Fortunately, Toby's not going to make me do that, but he is going to teach me the range of movements a knight would need to perfect. Can you raise the sword in the air to strike? That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Some armour won't let you move that much. Oh, really? That's, that's a decent level of movement. Yeah. 
And then, of course, you know, if you're fighting me with no equipment, any part of your body will hurt me. Oh, you I see. You know, you can strike yeah, with the, yeah, if yeah. you're in tight and you feel you can't move, you can still strike with your elbow, yeah. you can strike with your head, you know, you can slam someone with the breastplate. I feel like that would do you a lot know. of damage. If it's what you got, use it, <laughs> you know. I mean, the armor is turning your whole body into a weapon. Yeah, yeah. You, know, you just have to f know what the, the limits of the equipment are. Part of being a knight is to be managing the situation with your kit so it all looks effortless and you never look clumsy. Yeah. It's very tough. It's very, very tough. I've never felt less graceful, I'll be honest. <laughs> you could get there. You could get there. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. Well, <laughs> unsurprisingly, that was really difficult. I'm ridiculously sweaty. I feel like I've been working out for hours. You can really tell how much training I would need to not only get used to this as a kind of second skin, but also be able to operate it in a knightly way with race and decorum. There's not much that you can see and you're kind of really aware that there could be people all around you, there could be people anywhere. I was expecting to feel very powerful, but I actually, felt quite small and, and felt quite vulnerable. The quilting process creates a certain amount of shrinkage. and Ninja's estimated she needs to allow an extra 10% of material. It's now time to see if her calculations are correct. That's actually pretty amazing. So this is, Phew. This is the original <laughs> pattern size, as it should be. This started out 10% wider, and that's pretty Close. Up to where we want it. That's, Good. Yeah. Having taken the embroiderer's 900 hours to complete, the leopards and fleur de lis need to be cut out and sewn on. Mm, they've not filled in this section here. <laughs> oh, wow. No, they haven't. It's mm. a hole. Yep. So all the embroidery's been worked on white linen, which is as the original was. They've missed out a few little stitches, and so there's a tiny little white patch that shouldn't be a white patch and we were wondering whether to cut it out so that it would be a little red patch underneath or um, look or leave it. it but I think that little white patch will <laughs> offend the eye so I think the better thing to do is to actually just over sew it with this colour thread because it's luckily quite a small area and I don't think it will be noticeable really. We've worked out at the rate we're going at the moment, it's looking like 10 days work for one person to just sew the embroidery on. And yes, we've done one and a little tiny bit. Mm. This is the first time in my life I've had to be trained to wear an outfit. But the fact is, even if I'd been born in the Black Prince's time, I'd still never have worn this jupe on. It was made for a prince. It was made for a warrior. Oh my God, look at how much gold there is. The colours, that's so amazing. It's a lot of gold, isn't it? It's so much, <laughs> I just love it. I can't believe how bright, how vibrant it is. It's just completely brought it to life. Yeah. Like compared it's... with the, you know, the, the actual 600 year old Dupont that we saw, just to see it like this is, is just incredible. Like with the armour underneath it as well, it just looks so majestic. It really does. There's it, no mistaking who this person is. <laughs> absolutely no mistaking. You can really feel how much protection that would give. I imagine it really would. I think you'd feel quite safe in there. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. This, the fleur de lis embroidery, is absolutely exquisite, isn't it? There's just something about the gold on the blue that is just stunning, isn't it? Really, really beautiful. Yeah, really beautiful. I feel like I shouldn't be allowed to touch it. Do you want to try it on? Absolutely. <laughs> I really, really do. <laughs> so how many people would it have taken to get the Black Prince ready like this? Well, he probably would have had at least three, actually, at this stage, getting him ready. Royal uh, members of the household all had their own personal, what were known as body servants, people who were actually allowed to touch 
the king's body or the prince's body mm. um, in order for it not to take a, a, a painfully long time. Are you in? I'm in. I am in. Does it feel incredibly heavy now that everything's on? Yeah, it does feel really heavy. It's just, it's such an unusual feeling. It's kind of turning yourself into a kind of robot. It's like, you know, like a war machine, <laughs> really. You do look almost twice the size. Yeah, <laughs> it's just such a different stature. You know, you, you go through life inhabiting your body. And I'm used to, you know, not only being female, but being small, I'm short yeah. and I'm small. Yeah. <laughs> this is something incredibly alien for me. When I did the armour training, there's a certain lack of mobility, and I thought that the jupon on top would really increase that. But it didn't actually make it any more difficult to move around. However, it was a lot heavier. You've got this padded velvet, you've got the metallic thread. It's a lot of extra weight that you're carrying around. You can see that so much training would have been necessary to actually wear this. This has taught me a lot about the Black Prince and about how he would have wanted other people to perceive him. This item is so in your face. He's really turning himself into a human target. This is completely different to our contemporary idea of camouflage in warfare. He's saying, this is me and you simply can't ignore me. And at the same time, he's a fantastic rallying point for the troops as well. He's really there on the battlefield, leading his men in this incredibly garish, bright piece of clothing. As a historian, you're always trying to imagine the past and imagine it as accurately as you possibly can based on the evidence. I spend a lot of time in museums looking at dress um, in cabinets underneath glass and being able to touch this and feel it and know that it's the same textures, the same materials that would have been felt in the 14th century is really incredible. Marie Antoinette is seen as history's ultimate fashion icon and its ultimate fashion victim. Her extravagant wardrobe is the stuff of legend and yet not a single gown known to have been worn by her survives today. What we do have are portraits, like this one painted in 1783 by the Queen's favourite artist, Vigie Le Brun. And its story, and the story of the dress she wears in it, are as scandalous and as intriguing as the Queen herself. When this portrait was unveiled, it caused huge damage to an already unpopular monarchy. It looks really informal for a court portrait, especially those of Marie Antoinette, who we associate with this very lavish, sumptuous clothing. So I'm really keen to unravel the story behind it. Now, fashion and dress took on a really ideological role during the fall of the French monarchy. So I really want to see what this portrait can tell us about this tumultuous period in history, and especially the place of Marie Antoinette within that. The chemise à la reine, as the gown worn in this portrait became known, was a radical departure for Marie Antoinette and a complete contrast to the highly structured garments favoured by the rest of the court. I'm keen to find out from Ninja if the dress is as simple as it looks. So, Marie Antoinette, as a figure, still looms large in the history of fashion and in pop culture in general. But this portrait of her is a very different Marie Antoinette from the very wide skirts and very elaborate silks that we're used to seeing her in. So, what is this dress actually made of? It's actually made of a very fine cotton muslin. So I've got some samples here. It comes in super, super fine or um, slightly more opaque. So soft, aren't they? It's more like, uh, well, hence why it was so shocking at the time. It's more like a nightdress or underwear, really. Yeah. My understanding of the time is that with this style of gown, the chemise à la reine, you'd still have your stays and your petticoat underneath and they would still be silk 
in the tradition. So how mm. do we know that she's wearing stays under this? It was still a very strong convention at this date. It's a very radical thing to be wearing the chemise on the outside when it's essentially a piece of underwear, but it's a whole other step for a lady to just let go of her stays altogether. Yeah. <laughs> So how will you make the stays? Well, I'm going to get Harriet to make the stays and she'll be making them from a linen foundation covered with a silk brocade. And we found some really lovely brocade. Oh, wow, oh, look at that. I know, it's got little birds and flowers oh. and it feels to me very Marie Antoinette. It's very Marie Antoinette, <laughs> isn't it? Definitely. And so what particular sort of tools or techniques will you be using to recreate this? Lots of bone channels to sew and bones to prepare and insert into those channels. It's quite hard on the hands. You have to be quite strong, mm -hmm. actually, to make a good pair of stays. And then the chemise, it's really just an awful lot of um, fine hand sewing because all the sewing is very much on show with the fabric being very sheer like right. that. And it's really important that all of the edges of the muslin are very, very straight. That sounds incredibly <laughs> fiddly. Uh, it's very just, yeah. skillful. Again, like we so often say, that it, it looks like, oh, this will be a, a simple one. But there's a lot of yards of hand sewing in that. As it's held in private ownership, we don't have access to the original painting. But its sister portrait hangs at Marie Antoinette's private Versailles getaway, Le Petit Trianon, where the Austrian-born queen escaped the stultifying etiquette of the French court and the chemise gown became the unofficial uniform among her inner circle. It's also where I'm meeting art curator Juliette Trey. So Marie Antoinette's pose in this portrait is very similar to the chemise à la Reine portrait. What's the relationship between the two? Oh, they're very close. Um, this portrait is actually a kind of replica. The portrait with the chemise dress was shown at the Salon in 1783, and it caused a great scandal. And so Vigée Lebrun had to take the painting away and replace it straight away. So she kept exactly the same pose, but changed, she changed the dress. And so what was so shocking about the chemise dress portraits? So the Salon is a public exhibition that takes place at the Louvre every two years and absolutely everybody goes to the Salon. The chemise dress was worn already at Versailles, but it could be worn inside, it could be worn at the Petit Trianon, but it could not be worn as a formal dress. And the problem with the Salon is that the Queen appears in front of all the people who come to visit the Salon. It's as if she's here herself, and she could not appear in front of everyone in a, an informal dress. So that was quite inappropriate. Cotton and muslin, which were used for the dress, were also the materials you would use for underwear. And it was also shocking that way to see the Queen showing herself in her underwear, so to say. So it was more the audacity of having this painting shown in public than the actual dress itself that was shocking. Absolutely. That goes completely against the idea that she's the Queen. She should be there for her people and she should assume her responsibility as a monarch. How much did this damage the reputation of Marie Antoinette? It's hard to say exactly because she was never very much loved by the French people, but we could say that it is the beginning of a downfall. Well, I've got the lovely silk brocade for the Marie Antoinette stays. And I'm just looking to see where the pattern lies because obviously we don't want to cut it wastefully and we want the final pattern to be displayed best on the, the actual pieces of the, the stays. Early stays, you, you have some whalebone, very, very expensive, but many stays are stiffened with um, reeds. They were called bents, it's like dried grasses. Like these? Yes. <laughs> So you can see individually they have no strength at all but when you bundle them up together and hold them very tightly inside a channel it's very good, very flexible. It's a wonderful material and even up to the 19th century there's, there's records of, of women, poor women, going and seeking down by the riverside seeking rushes to, to stiffen their own stays with. 
I think this is Marie Antoinette chemise. Ooh. Wow. That's, that's gorgeous. exactly, isn't it? Really lovely. So that's her sash. And here's the muslin. Lovely, lovely. Yeah, She's going nice to look choice. very fresh, isn't she? She is. Yeah. As with everything worn by Marie Antoinette, the chemise à la reine became the height of fashion. Chemise gowns are so delicate, there are only two known to be in existence. One is held at a small museum near the Palace of Versailles. When we think about 18th century women's clothing, we tend to think about court dress, very formal, very structured, the silks, the panniers, you know, the enormous shapes. Whereas this, I just would love to put it on and roll around on a chaise longue somewhere. <laughs> it looks like it would feel luxurious and comfortable and soft and just amazing and all right. Looking at it from a 21st century perspective, this dress does look very simple. That kind of pastoral, shepherdess style that Marie Antoinette was so in love with in Petit Trianon, uh, in the grounds of Versailles, wearing something like this, swanning around her gardens. You've got this kind of romantic, rural ideal. But what we also see is that simple as it is, it would still have been very expensive. The muslin itself was actually very expensive. It was an imported fabric. But crucially, at this time, keeping something white is very laborious, very time consuming, and so very, very expensive. It's kind of like wearing a status symbol. So essentially what it is, is a very wealthy woman's idea, a queen's idea of how a peasant might dress or how a shepherdess might dress, which is incredibly patronising when you think about it. And you can really see why that misquote, let them eat cake, really stuck to Marie Antoinette when you look at a dress like this. Wow, lots of different things going on here, lots of different colours. We've all got different bits of Marie Antoinette, haven't we? <laughs> so take me through in stages. I have the chemise à la reine. A feature of this garment is a very fine hem all the way, well, lots of very fine hems. And the only way you can do a really fine hem on a very thin fabric like this is if it's dead straight on the grain. And the way to get it dead straight on the grain is to draw out a thread first. You're drawing out one, one thread. thread from across this whole length of fabric. Yes. How, how on earth do you do that? I have a pin. <laughs> yeah. I pick up the thread with the pin and lift it up. There, you see? And you see how wow. it makes it pucker? Yeah. So I'm left with this very faint kind of line where I've pulled the thread out. Yeah. That's where I'll cut along with my shears oh, and yeah. then I'll know that I can do a nice hem on yeah. it. Wow, that sounds really, really fiddly. So what are you working on, Harriet? Well, I'm working on the stays. These get worn underneath. So um, these are quite tough garments. Um, they were cut out by men. Really? Big responsibility cutting fabric. Yeah. If you ruin the silk, then that's, that's a lot of money. A lot of money, mm. isn't it? How are you with scissors? Uh, OK. Let's throw caution to the winds. If you cut around this, cut around the edge, this, I feel quite stressed about this. So do I. <laughs> oh, gosh. So literally, I'm just cutting. You're just This cutting. exact shape. Mm. And it's all pinned on, it's so I should It's pinned on, it can't go anywhere. Okay. Unless I take it away. And if I do that, stop cutting, because <laughs> okay. something's gone wrong. All right, so I'm going in. Going in. She's doing it. Keep these upright. Keep those nice yeah. and upright. <laughs> 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 it's a lovely sound, isn't it? No, I can Enjoy hear the sound. is screaming inside my head. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. Okay. Good. Is that all right? Yes. 
<laughs> like how you yeah. all stop work and you're just staring. <laughs> no pressure. Well, she's got my shears. I was going to cut them. Oh, <laughs> Come along, apprentice. Oh, dear. Yeah. I feel like I'm going to lose control of them because they're so... I feel like the end of them is so far away from my hand. <laughs> oh, it's tricky. The curves... Yay! Lovely! Congratulations! <laughs> Brilliant! Oh, and so how, how would you rate my cutting? Fair. <laughs> Very good. Can I have my shears back? Please? Yes, of course. <laughs> Thank you. For a real sense of how radical a departure the new look was, we have one remaining direct link to Marie Antoinette. Her wardrobe book for 1782, just one year before our portrait was painted. I cannot wait to see this. This is amazing. Oh, wow. So this book is so exciting to look at. Some of these swatches here, you can see tiny, tiny pinpricks. Now, some historians have suggested that this is where Marie Antoinette would go through this book and choose the fabrics that she wanted to wear that day by putting a pin in them. If that's the case, then what we're looking at here, just in these tiny holes, is her making these aesthetic decisions, these fashion choices that would go on to define her. It just feels like such a tangible link to the past. The idea that, you know, she may have been looking through these, deciding what to wear. That's something that all of us do every day. We get up, we decide what we're going to wear. <gasps> These tiny embroidered flowers are absolutely exquisite and, again, just really fit into that idea of this sort of pastoral romanticism that was so in vogue at this time and that Marie Antoinette herself was such a champion of. Really beautiful array of silks. Lyon in France was a huge centre of silk production at this time. What Marie Antoinette wore was taken up by her fellow courtiers, people outside of the court. Everyone wanted to dress like the Queen. She really set the fashions, which then, of course, filtered down to the rest of society. Seeing the extent of the patterns and the colours really brings home how much of a contrast it would be to suddenly see Marie Antoinette dressed in a very simple muslin gown. She was accused of putting tens of thousands of silk merchants out of work, of silk manufacturers out of work. From looking through these wardrobe books, we really get a sense of why Marie Antoinette's attempt to simplify her wardrobe became an issue of such contention. It really went against two of the most important aspects of her royal life. She was expected to encourage French manufacturing, support the silk industry, and she was also expected to inspire respect for the throne. And in dressing like this pastoral shepherdess, she really didn't do that. She was seen as transgressing class boundaries and she became this incredibly divisive figure. I am sewing on casings for the drawstrings in the sleeves of the chemise a la reine. So this is one sleeve and you can see the three um, casings that I'm sewing in and at the end of each casing there's an eyelet hole because through those eyelet holes will be threaded um, 
a tape. I've got this nice thin cotton tape to thread through. And it will create this puffy arrangement that you can see in the portrait. She's got these puffed up, gathered bits. I'm still working on the stays. There is a lot of work in a pair of stays, which is ironic when you consider that they then get covered up and not seen at all. The way this stitch goes, you're coming out of one side and going down into the fold of the seam allowance on the other side. And you go right across it because it's going to be um, going through all the layers to get as much of a grip on the other side as you can. And then you swing it round and you come down into the other side and do the same thing. And it's, it forms like a, a figure of eight, which again, kind of locks it together. And really, yeah, I mean, that's really not going anywhere. You can see light through it, just, but that's, that's breathing holes. By 1789, Marie Antoinette's popularity was at an all-time low. The previous winter had been so cold, the Seine froze over, and a bad harvest meant there wasn't enough bread. To many, the court, and particularly the foreign-born queen, symbolised all that was wrong with the country. On July the 14th, an angry mob stormed the Bastille prison, which had become a symbol of royal dictatorial rule. The French Revolution had begun. Marie Antoinette spent the last nine weeks of her life here at the Conciergerie, a medieval palace turned prison, where she was completely stripped of her royal prestige and was known as the Widow Capet. In strict mourning for her husband, Louis XVI, beheaded some months earlier, the queen, who had railed against the lack of privacy at the French court, was under constant surveillance. I'm here to meet historian Andrew Hussey to find out more about Marie Antoinette's last days. So we're here in what I think is, is quite a beautiful room. It's a chapel of remembrance, but it's on the site of the cell that Marie Antoinette was held in for the last nine weeks of her life. Do we know anything about her state of mind while she was here? We know that she came here in the early hours of August the 2nd, um, 1793. And a bit like now, there was a heat wave in Paris and it was famously sweltering when she got to this cell. And she arrived about two or three o'clock in the morning. I think probably in 21st century terms, she, we would say she was in deep shock and, and trauma and she never really recovered from that. What would her life here have been like? Do you know what? It's hard to imagine a sharper difference between life at Versailles which was the big society of the spectacle, the great open spaces, the great mise-en-scene, the fête galante, you know, all these big parties they had and all of this, the orgies and all that kind of thing, to this claustrophobic, sweltering, nightmarish scene out of Kafka. But, but, the two are interlinked. And in some ways, without being too clever about it, this is the direct contrast that, that, that links the society of spectacle on both sides. Um, because here now, she becomes a celebrity criminal. How much did her love of fashion, her love of novelty and luxury, how, how big a part did that play in her downfall? I don't think Marie Antoinette was guileless. She wasn't a stupid woman and she knew what she was doing. And what she was doing was pursuing an aesthetic life rather than a political life. The problem was in France at that time, anything you did was political. So she was, as it were, caught in a, in a trap that whatever she did, she was, she was you know, um, going to be judged on, on you know, how she looked, how she performed and so on. So the fashion side of it wasn't the ditzy um, Austrian queen of legend, but it was always going to be portrayed in terms of decadence, in terms of the dangers of absolutism. Now the famous misquote, let them eat cake, how true is this version of Marie Antoinette that we have? I think on both sides of the channel, particularly in Britain actually, we've got this carry on, don't lose your head, um, <laughs> you know, version of, repeated version of, of Marie Antoinette. And it's not true, she was a real woman who was really killed. And she was killed just down the road in Place de la Concorde in a city that was full of febrile revolutionaries. And where, as, as, as late as the early 19th century, animals would not cross the bridge over to Place de la Concorde because the, the stench of blood 
under the pave was so powerful. And I, I think we forget, you know, that this was a city that had become a slaughterhouse. It was full of killers and it was full of the rabid, ferocious, murderous energy that goes with a great massive political upheaval. And she was the woman who lost her life. And she started losing it here in this cell in the heat wave in August. On October the 16th, 1793, Marie Antoinette shed her widow's weeds and slipped on a white chemise she'd managed to keep hidden from the guards, over which she wore a simple white dress and went to meet her death. Crowds lining the streets were stunned into silence when confronted by this modest, spectral figure, her prematurely white hair matching her carefully chosen clothes. And so Marie Antoinette saved her most powerful fashion statement for last. no way that somebody would think this was an underwear chemise. With all of the layers as well, it's really not in any way see-through. So I'd, you also get a sense that what really angered people was this idea of class transgression, that she was trying to dress like some kind of shepherdess or mm -hmm. a farmer's daughter. And, you know, when you're wearing this, the idea of doing any kind of herding sheep <laughs> is just It's a horrific ridiculous. pastiche, isn't it, in that respect? Yeah. It's so much more kind of meringue-y. <laughs> it is, in effect, Princess Diana's wedding dress. Yes. Really. Yes. But she wasn't wearing the stays that you're wearing, so she had a defined curvy body, and you have the, the conical 18th century body. The sash is a triumph, Hannah. Yes, it is. It's really lovely. It is weightless mm. to wear it completely. It's like the only pressure on your body is the pressure of the stays. Mm. So then to wear something like this after having worn silks would have felt incredibly liberating, I think. Very, very freeing. So fascinating wearing this, having really you know, spent some time inside her life, almost and thinking about the magnitude of that, that moment when the portrait went on display. Yeah, it's quite unlike anything that came before, isn't it? Yeah. I suppose she was damned for wearing too much silk and then damned for wearing none. <laughs> Poor thing. Yeah. She really couldn't win. She really couldn't win. Mm. Wearing this dress, I wasn't expecting how much kind of volume and structure all of the interior lacing was going to give it. So it had a much more dramatic silhouette. And also, of course, you have the, the physical experience of wearing stays, wearing the corset underneath, gives so much more structure and formality than you were expecting with a garment that has always been talked about as being too informal for a queen to wear. It really gave me an understanding of why it would appeal to Marie Antoinette. The lightness of the fabric, it's just a completely a world away from what she would have been expected to wear at court, these very sort of strict rules of etiquette and dress that we know she really did not like. She felt very constrained by this. So the weightlessness, the freedom, the liberation that this garment offered, you really get a sense of that when you actually have it on. Clothes affect the way that we move through the world. They affect the way that we stand, the way we hold ourselves, 
And so having the experience of putting these clothes, wearing these clothes on the body, feeling the way that these people would have felt and would have moved through the world is a really invaluable experience. For almost 200 years, this painting was described simply as a portrait of Lady Elizabeth Murray, and it was assumed her unidentified companion was a maid. Only in the 1980s was it discovered that far from being a servant, the other girl was in fact Lady Elizabeth's cousin, Dido Elizabeth Bell. Hers is a story that takes us from the slave ships of the Mediterranean to the heart of Georgian high society. When I look back through the history of Western art, what I'm inevitably confronted with is a lot of faces that look like mine, i.e. they're white. So what really drew me to this portrait of Dido and Elizabeth is the fact that it's so unusual to see a picture from this time that depicts a black subject and a white subject with equal status. There's something about Dido that I find incredibly human and really compelling. And I also think that from the tiny amount I know about her backstory already, that it's gonna lead us into some much darker areas in the history of fashion. And I'm really keen to confront those areas and to explore them further. From what can be seen, Dido's dress appears both elegant and simple, but I'm interested to find out from Ninja what type of gown it may be. This portrait, dress-wise, a little bit of an enigma, isn't it? It is. <laughs> it, is it is quite difficult to work out exactly um, what she's wearing. What are your thoughts here? There are so many possibilities with how we could interpret that garment. Unfortunately, like so many portraits, we can't see her back. And it's particularly obscured by all these kind of layers of sashes and things in exactly the places where we would look for clues as to how it's constructed. And this sort of basket of fruit yeah. that she's carrying as well. Yeah. Do we have any other portraits that we can sort of compare in terms of types of garment that we think she might be wearing. Yeah, there are actually helpfully lots of paintings of 18th century women wearing uh, these more relaxed exotic styles and um, helpfully they're not all holding something in front of them <laughs> like Taito is. Great. So this lady here for example, you can see how very loose in cut this gown is. It's a, a simple crossover and I do think that the neckline that Dido's got there with this V shape can only be achieved in the 18th century, really, by, by having a crossover yeah. wrapping front. This is very, very similar, isn't it? Yeah, I think that's a real strong contender for how the front would, would look if we, could, if we could see it. Now, some of the reading I've been doing about this portrait describes it as silver. And it's my understanding that at this time, silver was quite a popular mm. colour for wedding dresses. Wedding dresses would have been a bit more formal than this. Mm. What kind of fabric do you think this is? Well, I don't believe it is silver. I've got a sample here of some silk that has silver thread woven into it. And um, it doesn't drape in the same way that I think the fabric Dido is wearing drapes. It's quite stiff because the only way to incorporate silver into a silk fabric in the 18th century was to weave actual threads of silver. So it's, it's metal. Right. And although it's a soft metal, it still changes the nature of the fabric. Yeah. And I think this is too stiff for what we want to achieve with Dido. Yeah, it almost stays into the shape that you it, fold it, doesn't it? Does, it does, yeah. That, that it, it's lovely, stiff. it's beautiful, and it would make a, a lovely formal wedding dress, but that's <laughs> yeah. not what we're doing. No. So what I think we should be looking at is um, satin. A silk satin is really a very, very typical choice for these kinds of uh, informal robe and wrapping gown and a la Turk styles. Yeah. Um, I think we definitely want a satin that's a you know, a very cool kind of ivory, possibly, mm -hmm. or even a light grey, um, which could be interpreted as silver, but not actual silver. We have very little information with which to piece together Dido's story. But what we do know is that she was born in 1761, the illegitimate daughter of Captain John Lindsay and Maria Bell, an enslaved African woman on a Spanish ship captured by Lindsay. At some point in her infancy, Dido was sent to live with her father's uncle, Lord Mansfield, Britain's Lord Chief Justice and one of the most powerful men of his day. 
I'm keen to find out if the portrait can unwrap any secrets of Dido's life. So I'm meeting art historian Vicky Coltman at Schoon Palace, Lord Mansfield's birthplace where the painting now hangs. Now I've completely fallen in love with this portrait, um, but I'm very interested to hear you contextualise this for me. How unusual is this for a late 18th century portrait? Well, in terms of later 18th century British art history, this is a really atypical image, mainly because we have these two women, one with a black complexion, one with a white complexion, presented more or less as social equals. And it's extremely rare to find that on canvas, because what we're dealing with in this period is a long pictorial tradition of black servant portraiture in which they're shown as very much subservient to their female mistresses. And what we see here is an image from that mid 17th century period, which is absolutely typical. We have here this black servant on the right. Also notice how he's looking up towards the female sitter. And really he's there to say to you and I, the external viewers, direct your gaze to her. So he becomes a kind of interlocutor for her beauty. And so if we then leap forward over a hundred years, what we can see immediately is how there's none of that subservience. I think this is an image that speaks of things like sisterhood, companionship. One theory is that Dido has maybe been dressed in clothes that aren't her own to highlight some kind of exoticism. Mm -hmm. Do you think that could be the case? So Dido's dress, so what people have made of this, and you're quite right, is they've looked at the turban and they've suggested that her dress may be indebted to the idea of masquerades, which are very popular at this time, which are kind of fancy dress parties. I'm not so sure, but what we can say is that it looks to me to be very shiny and glimmery for a day dress. So I think it's unlikely that she's going to be in the poultry yard or the dairy <laughs> wearing this dress. I personally am slightly sceptical of the sort of over exoticized mm -hmm. uh, readings of this portrait. Um, a lot has been made of the turban. Mm. Um, the turban was very fashionable headgear at the time, I think. Uh, and definitely due to it being a sort of slightly exotic object. But I think that that doesn't necessarily confer on Dido this kind of exotic, objectified status. Mm. And that would also fit in with the style of dress from what we can work out from the actual portrait itself. Uh, and the fact that it's more dynamic, she's mm. not wearing um, any kind of panniers or hoops under mm. her skirts in the way that Elizabeth is. I find Dido as a subject much more compelling. <laughs> she looks like the one who's fun, the one who I want to hang out with, <laughs> yeah. the one that I want to spend time with. I absolutely agree. I think Dido looks incredibly mischievous, actually. I'd much rather hang out with Dido. While I'm finding out about Dido's life, Ninja is trying to discover more about the style of her dress. What's really frustrating about Dido is that her bowl of fruit and her sashes and her arm are all exactly... In the crucial area. In the yeah. point that would really tell us what's going on with that, because yeah. the other possibility that you were playing with, was it this one or the... No, this oh, one. Oh, the back, yes. Was, the, was that the back might be cut as a loose yes. sack back. To give it a bit more fullness below, and also because that's a fashionable element. Yeah. Uh, you know why I don't think it can be a sack back? Mm. I've just thought of this, is that <laughs> the way that the, the, this top edge of, yeah. the, of the pleats is covered up in the 18th century is with a, a, an extra yeah. strip, which then goes down here and, and it's the robing, isn't it? And it's a classic. She doesn't have it. Look, and it doesn't it doesn't fit with anything else in the cut of that that twirl. So yeah, I was uncomfortable about that. Thank you. The other um, possibility is that something like yeah. this jacket. That's very simple, isn't it? And, yes. And actually quite loose. If you imagine that as full length, and and this gusset here expand, expanding out. Well, I kind of had that thought too, and I like that. I did put that back onto this one. Oh, that's that one. Yes, <laughs> yeah, it hasn't worked when you look. Oh. It's it's kind of it's it's nice. The back is nice and the and the seams are nice, but it the way it hangs down now, it's neither one thing nor another. That so um, yeah, doesn't work for me. That garment is not a classic Western garment like her cousin is wearing. 
It is no. different, and I think that's the point. They're, they're making her different. Mm. So we don't know whether she had that herself or whether it was part of the, the painter's clothing. We don't know anything about it, sadly, do we? We don't know the story that led up to the painting and what her thoughts were. And we assume she was put into that to make a contrast. But she might have chosen it. And what's this, what, this one? That is a bed gown. Do you think that's a possibility? It is. I think you're going to have to do another 12. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we have the new twelve. What I really like is this all-in-one yes. sleeve. I think it's just the most convincing. It, yeah, and and hers isn't actually huge. Some of them are very big, but hers we is could not. Could probably make that a little bit smaller. Smaller. And that definitely. And that tight, That's really yeah. snug on her, isn't it? With it. Yes, and it really wrinkles down. It must have a little button or something yeah. there. I think. Yeah. Three twelves lucky. <laughs> oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Raised by the Mansfields alongside her cousin, Lady Elizabeth, Dido grew up in luxury at Kenwood House, a world away from the experiences of most black people in England at the time. S.I. Martin is an expert on black British history, and I'm hoping he can tell me more about Dido's life at Kenwood. This is, you know, a far cry from the way that most people in Georgian Britain would have grown up. But I would imagine that for a black woman, it's especially unusual. There was something very particular about Dido's situation, though it wasn't unique. There were other black people, particularly people of mixed background, um, who had, uh, similar to Dido's own parentage, one white male father and usually a black enslaved mother who were lucky enough to enjoy some degree of the luxuries that Dido would have enjoyed. But it's true to say that her experiences overall were very different from the vast majority of black people living in Britain at the time. And she worked um, within the grounds as yeah. well, doesn't she, at the, at the home? Was that usual? Yeah, work of the sort that Dido was engaged in, um, low-level household duties, looking after the dairy, uh, working with Nord Mansfield, note-taking, light accounts, these would be the occupations of a gentleman woman of the period and perhaps Dido considered herself as such but they wouldn't have been the duties with which um, the lady of the house would have bothered her herself and I doubt very much if uh, Lady Elizabeth would have had anything to do in those domains at all. One interesting uh, feature of um, the likeness of Dido in the painting is that she is wearing um, both a turban and an ostrich feather yeah and Although at the time the wearing of turbans had become quite fashionable amongst some parts of the upper classes, it's also a signifier uh, for a lot of young black people in domestic service. So Dido's life here at Kenwood, her family, the relationships that they had, she was clearly cared for. Although we know that she was fawned on and that she was a great favourite and confidant um, of um, Lord Mansfield, Dido is illegitimate. She did not always dine with her blood relations, as they were. She is um, definitely outside family. This would have been a very difficult issue just to negotiate socially and culturally to meet others outside the family, even within the family. It would have caused problems, and that would have set her apart. I'm starting to get more of a sense of Dido's world, but I feel that many of the details of her life are still hidden. Last time I saw Ninya, details of the dress were proving equally elusive, so I'm looking forward to finding out what decisions have been made. This is the pattern. It's a very common style amongst various um, ethnic garments across the world. It's, it's the idea that you want to use as much of the material as possible, have no wastage at all because materials are very expensive and time-consuming to make, and it's making the most of the materials as you cut, so planning ahead. So if you look at this, this is um, the neck. It's going to come oh, out of there. Yeah. This is the, the sleeve, and this is the body. Great. And this piece that we cut out of there to make the sleeve fits very cunningly down here. Ah, that's clever, isn't it? Yeah, to increase the size of the skirt. I see. The joy yeah. of it is, because it's such a simple cut, all the beauty is going to come from, from the material oh, itself. Oh, and it is so beautiful, this It satin. is wonderful. Excellent. I look cannot wait to see it. Wow, look so at that. So you can see how you could interpret that as silver. 
Yeah, and absolutely. And it's not, it's just I mean, pure silk, but... It does look silvery, yeah. doesn't it? It really yeah. does. It's very it's, pleasing. It's a very pale grey, but it's, it's pure silk and there's no actual metal thread in it, so it's going to be ever so soft and drapey and gorgeous. Yeah, it's just absolutely beautiful when it has wonderful sort of, depth, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, it really does. It really does. So this is looking very exciting. Yes, I've done about six versions of this <laughs> <Wow. term. laughs> but using muslin rather than the real silks. So here I'm just um, doing the draping of this line here. So would you like to have a go at trying to emulate that? Yeah, there. So I'd love to. You want to pull this back on itself like that. OK. So, and I'll then will it, it all be pinned? How yeah. is it going to be sort of secured? Once we've played around with it and draped it happily, then uh, I'll sew it so that you can't see the stitching. I see. Right, um, right. Which will also be helped with disguising it because of the jewels on her turban. Yeah. Um, so if there are any stitches that can't be helped, but to be seen, then they'll be covered with jewels. Right. So... Oh, that looks fab. I love those pleats. So I'll just pin it a bit here so that it um, doesn't move. Now, my instinct is to try to make it a bit more elaborate and use this to create some kind of, like, fan shape at the <laughs> side or at the back, but that wouldn't be quite accurate, would it? No, this is quite a subtle little addition, I think. You don't always need so much accessorising to... Oh, uh... I have to disagree, <laughs> I must say. <laughs> <laughs> so, will this all form the lining? Will we be yes. tucking this in on itself to yeah. create the lining? And then, once it's all pinned, I'll sew around the outside, mm -hmm. um, so it'll be like a proper brim. Yeah. This is fun, this, <laughs> this bit. You can see immediate returns <laughs> doing this. <laughs> it's quite satisfying. I think that's rightly pinned, so we'll just put it on there. Look at that. Lovely. Fabulous. Happy with that? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very little written evidence of Dido's life exists, but she does appear in the household account books still held at Kenwood House, and I've been given special permission to see them. Well, I'm here in the glorious surroundings, this amazing neoclassical room, um, which is the library that Dido would have spent quite a lot of time in. What I've got here is some of the household accounts. And so in here, we do get some very small glimpses of Dido's life. Dido, quarter allowance due October the 4th, five pounds. So she was given 20 pounds a year, paid in quarterly instalments. Towards the end of the 1780s, Dido's allowance was also supplemented by birthday gifts and Christmas gifts as well. We can see one here to Dido at Christmas um, by Lord Mansfield's order. Now this one is probably my all-time favourite, washing and glazing Dido's bed. Now, what that tells us is that uh, likely her bed was decorated with chintz hangings. Now, chintz was glazed fabric and was very, very fashionable at this time as well. So it does give us a sort of insight into Dido's world, into Dido's life here. While the account books give us a tantalising peek into Dido's home life, we get a more tangible insight from the diary of Thomas Hutchinson an American visitor to Lord Mansfield. A black came in after dinner and sat with the ladies, and after coffee walked with the company in the gardens, one of the young ladies having her arm within the other. She is neither handsome nor genteel, pert enough. He calls her Dido, which I suppose is all the name she has. He knows he has been reproached for showing fondness for her. I dare say not criminal. Hutchinson's attitude highlights Dido's position perfectly. She was well loved by her family, but as the daughter of a slave in 18th century England, she was never going to be accepted as their social equal. The fact is that when this portrait was painted, Britain's participation in the slave trade was at its height. By the 18th century, demand for English cotton was booming. Easily washable and colourful, it was becoming the fashion fabric of choice for the middle classes and a valuable trading commodity driving the Industrial Revolution. However, the great wealth this brought the nation was built upon enslaved labour in Britain's colonies. 
To find out more, I'm meeting historian Alan Rice. So how important to the cotton industry around here was slave-produced cotton from America? Well, in the 1780s and 1790s, slave-produced cotton started exploding onto the scene here. So a town like Manchester and its environs becomes a kind of world centre of cotton production. And that kind of bursts through and helps to fuel what becomes the Industrial Revolution. And how important was the cotton industry for the British economy? Very, very important. If you look at uh, 1780, it's two or three percent uh, of the exports from Britain are finished cotton goods. By the 1820s, 1830s, it's gone up to 22, 23 percent. So it's exceptionally important for the British economy in that it's a fifth of the economy. Also, a seventh of the population, the working population, are working in cotton based industries. Wow. in the mid-19th uh, mid century. We, we don't tend to think of um, Britain as have been, having such involvement in slavery because with America, you can still go and visit the old plantations mm -hmm. and there's more of a sort of physical legacy. Mm. But here, what, what we tend to forget, I think, is that there's such an economic legacy of slavery. Mm. The late 18th century is that moment when Britain is the most active slaving power. Liverpool is going into a, a frenzy of slave trading and is the largest slave port in the world. And so Dido's mother, Maria, we yeah. don't know much about her. We know she was on a Spanish slave ship mm. at some point. What would life have been like for her? Well, life would have been pretty grim. Um, she'd be chained in the hold of a slave ship, usually three or 400 people in a very enclosed space, often the women separated from the men so that they're available for the crew and the captain. And they, they'd only been brought up from the, um, from the hold once a day, maybe twice a day for exercise, and they'd be made to dance at those points to keep them, their limbs from moving. We don't know much about the specific ship that Maria was on. We know it was captured by Captain Lindsay and that he took Maria under his wing. Now, we, we know nothing about that kind of relationship other than the fact that it ended up with um, him having a, a black daughter with Maria, Dido Bell. Out of the millions of black women taken on board slave ships and their immediate descendants, I think it's an incredible thing that we have a likeness and a portrait of one of those individuals. Most of those lives, we have, we have nothing to remember them by. As Lord Chief Justice, Dido's great uncle was one of the most powerful legal voices of the century. His ruling granting freedom to an escaped slave, James Somerset, is considered one of the most significant milestones of the abolition movement. In his will, as well as leaving her some money, Lord Mansfield wrote, I confirm to Dido Elizabeth Bell her freedom. Despite his landmark ruling, slavery wasn't abolished in the British Empire for another 40 years. No one was more aware of Dido's precarious position than her great uncle. At times, learning about Dido has been an emotional experience, and I'm looking forward to seeing the gown of this once forgotten, vivacious young woman be brought back to life. Oh, wow. Oh my God. <laughs> the iridescence of the silk is just amazing, isn't it? It's oh like a God. pearl, isn't it? Yeah, it's really beautiful. I feel like I'm about to go to a costume ball in the 1920s. I was not expecting that at all. I was very sceptical of this idea that she may have been dressed with a specific costume purpose in mind, whether it was being dressed by the artist or whether it was the idea that this wasn't her actual clothing, but putting it on. I feel very, very differently about that idea. And it's not just that I'm wearing historic clothing, that it feels like a costume, but it's the drapery and the fact that there is a kind of orientalised idea 
I suppose. It's very non-functional, isn't it? That isn't a shawl to keep you warm. It's yeah. there to just make but you it's look also, nice. But it's also, it is very, I, I do wonder how much of an artistic affectation that shawl is. I mean, if we experimented, yeah. for example, with taking this off, and then you'd see the lovely sleeves oh. as well. Sleeves oh. are so beautiful. Because actually in the painting, the, the blue is, is very subtle. It's, muted, it's just yeah. touches, isn't it? Which is slightly distracting, but... I think it's nice without. Does and it feel less fancy dressy now, or does it, does it still feel fancy dressy? It feels slightly less fancy dressy, <laughs> but I mean, it's beautiful. The extra length that just means that you can see all, see the ruching yeah. and you know the way that that would have sort of sparkled in candlelight. Creating something where there are creases shows off the satin to the mm. best. Mm. And it really it, does. It is a very beautiful satin. You could just watch it drape mm. for hours. Mm. You? It's quite hypnotic. Anna, how do you feel about the turban? I think it was quite successful, actually. <laughs> it's definitely got that hat-like feel rather than a turban. Yeah. There's so much in the painting that you can't see that I think all you can say is it's, it's one of the possible solutions, and it's definitely a successful solution and a plausible one, mm. but it's not necessarily what she was wearing in the yeah. painting. She, it could have been one of our other theories, yeah. couldn't it? <laughs> so. Yeah. I do want to just lounge around in this <laughs> forever. I just wish we had a ball to send you to. I know. <laughs> Why do I never have a ball to go to? <laughs> Wearing this gown, as we've interpreted it, has actually changed my mind about my theories around Dido and around what she's wearing in this portrait. Initially, I was really quite certain that she was wearing a version of fashionable dress, a version of dress that was just becoming fashionable, um, you know, slightly more informal with these sort of uh, orientalised elements to it. However, having worn the ensemble, I'm not so sure that that's the case anymore. It did feel quite like wearing costume. Dido still remains tantalisingly just out of reach and in some ways I feel a bit disappointed um, that we haven't fully got to the bottom of this story. I feel very close to Dido and I feel like I've kind of let her down. I do feel like it's sort of symbolic of wider issues within history at times, especially reflecting marginalised histories that are more difficult to find out about. There's more work that needs to go into this. Um, and I feel like we will get there with Dido. I feel like there is more information out there and it will just take a bit more time and a bit more research. <laughs>